welcome. Welcome to the Crate and Crowbar, episode 104, being recorded on the 4th of August. I'm Marsh Davis. I'm joined tonight by the two Toms. I speak of none other than Tom Francis. Hello. And Tom Senior. Yellow. Two Toms, double the Tomage, which means twice as many people called Tom in a room at the same time. Half as much fun. <laughs> Uh, it's also Chris's birthday. Hey, happy birthday, birthday, Chris. Yeah, so fuck him. <laughs> uh, and he is at the International at the moment, uh, which is an exciting thing that's occurring. There's also Gamescom happening. Loads of stuff, loads of games stuff happening. Today was a big slew of trailers from the Microsoft conference. Mm. Did you see any of them? Saw all of them, and some of them were exciting, perhaps. I've written some <laughs> names down here. Should we go through them? Yeah, let's do it. Dark Souls 3. Yeah. I didn't watch that. Uh, I might play it, but <laughs> it's not. <laughs> There's no point in me watching a trailer because I haven't played the previous two, really. No, no, I mean, I'm really excited about it, but I wouldn't even bother watching the trailer, to be mm. honest. There's so little you can really tell about how much I'm going to like it from those trailers. Yeah. Mm. I mean, they're not really given a... a I, I know Chris was quite keen to big up the amount of kind of mechanical information we've been given so far, but none of it really sells me on, on, the, on the game. Like, mm. nothing is... Show me that it's changed in some kind of substantial and interesting way, which I think the series probably needs to do, rather than mm. just keep on playing the same furrow. What do you think about... Um, Even though I like that furrow. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it versus Bloodborne? Because I've, I haven't played Bloodborne, but I've, or, or indeed Dark Souls, really. <laughs> um, but I've read a lot about yeah. how it kind of... Uh, the lack of a shield and the replacement of that with a pistol and the way it rewards you for hyper-aggression is sort of generally seen as a net positive, sort of like fixing a problem with Dark Souls. So I'm not sure it's fixing a problem. It's definitely changing the, the system in Dark Souls. And I think that's why why it's such a good game, is mm. because it doesn't do... I mean, it, it borrows enough of the stuff that makes the Souls series interesting, but it also switches around enough stuff to make it really exciting and interesting and new. Really exciting in PvP as well, because it's so fast, and the dodge move is, mm. is so uh, quick that there's a lot of kind of twitch skill to PvP combat. There's a lot of skill to Dark Souls, but it felt... Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 it feels more about the build you have mm. than the actual kind of twitch skill you have in a fight the trailer was very noticeable in showing off quite a lot of for the trailer for Dark Souls 3 this mm. is showed a lot, lot of movement in combat which wasn't really necessarily a feature of uh, the Dark Souls game so maybe they've decided that the, the fast movement is a way to go and in combat dodging around things rolling around things yeah there's definitely a lot of faster rolling um, faster dodging there's also uh, Dark the Rolls Dark Rolls <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's also, there also a short bow, which apparently is like quite a rapid fire weapon, hmm. but also or, or almost a close range weapon. Which uh, bows always had a weird problem in Dark Souls of like, I always felt like I was cheating when I was using one because I'd have yeah. to hide in a corner and very slowly aim one. So there's a, a really interesting article um, on Gama Sutra written about the design of of Bloodborne's hunter pistol and the problems that he, this guy thinks it was solving in Dark Souls, and he reckons it was to solve both the fact that shields make you very passive. And the fact that bows are kind of like a, uh, almost feel like an exploit, like you can, mm. in fact, they are used some, for many exploits. Cases, yeah. um, and he reckons that those are two separate problems that they're trying to solve on the team, and then they realise the solution to them could be the same thing, which is <laughs> a <Yeah>. short range, <coughs> long range weapon uh, that is also works like has the parry effect of the shield, but doesn't have any other defensive advantages of the mm. shield. I do quite like the fact you can cheese things in the Dark Souls game using <laughs> a bow, though, partly because. They're, they're too hard for me <laughs> but also because um, it's a really good way of allowing people to progress while making them still feel like a shit heel <laughs> there's no way you can misinterpret that battle as a victory you know, <laughs> even though you've killed it you know. I think you can cheese manners can't you by being on a, a ledge yeah. and just firing into a random dark point below you and for some reason the level geometry means that that will hit him yeah, we never I sort did of felt that I only played Axiom Verge that's the, like, the only boss battle game that I that I play to an extent and uh, I felt like that each boss was just figure out how to exploit it like sort of almost that you couldn't yeah. fight a base on so you have to just find the one place where you can stand where you can shoot it without being hit back mm. Tomb Raider uh, otherwise known as Tombs of War <laughs> <laughs> let's fuck everything a lot of death edition. a, lot of shotgun, Is it a yeah. violent trailer uh, yeah it's just exclusively murdering dudes basically <laughs> in a variety of extremely horrific ways but in uh, beautiful places yeah in really beautiful places in a way that sounds more promising than last <laughs> what we've seen so far has just been her falling down slopes and like, oh, <laughs> yeah. fuck's yeah. sake I've had my fill of falling down slopes yeah no it's fun. I watched the gameplay trailer which showed off a really uh, lengthy kind of stealth and then kind of free combat section in quite a large 
expansive area. I was very really excited about it. Then I, then I realised that wasn't actually the, 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 the trailer trailer. I think yeah. that was some kind of separately launched, separately revealed thing. So it was the trailer trailer, and it's just this, you know, press forward to watch <laughs> Lara tumble down so an escarpment um, over and over again. So I don't know, it's going to be a game of two halves, one of which is shit. <laughs> but, um, it's the weird sort of um, uh, conflict at the heart of The Last Tomb Raider it, is that the thing it's pilloried for on the narrative side is that she's basically a mass murderer. But that's also probably the best thing about it mechanically. Yeah. <laughs> the combat's yeah, exactly, yeah. really quite good. Uh-huh. It did look really fun, actually, all the, all the stabbing you doing this. They, they did talk about having much larger areas. Mm. Like, they said five times the size or something of uh, the areas in the previous game. Level up by, you know, <laughs> killing wolves. And then and, uh, sit up fire and think about what you've done yeah. before getting, <laughs> unlocking the experience. While saving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, delivering a monologue about, oh, I don't really like wolves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully... Um, I, was, I was pleased to see her actually raiding tombs and stuff. Mm. It feels like it's Lara with a purpose as opposed to Lara finding herself, mm. which um, is more interesting to me, personally. Uh, Crackdown, which isn't a PC game, but it's interesting because it's got full-scale city demolition, which is powered by the cloud. Yeah, I still, I still the look. Cloud is probably PCs. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just what a wizard would say. Um, <laughs> so I automatically don't trust it, even though I've now seen footage in the uh, the latest mm. uh, trailer that it looks seriously impressive yeah. in terms of building destructibility. Tire skyscrapers toppling over into other skyscrapers, smashing other houses and stuff like it. Giant Somebody Godzilla room, game. Yeah. It does look awesome. What do you think the game mechanic sort of like no. to play? Like, is that an interesting thing from a gameplay perspective? Oh, oh not not uh, mm-hmm. not if going by the historical precedent, of the Crackdown series, <laughs> which has been only accidentally good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I imagine it's just a kind of messy sandbox, really, rather than any kind of structured. Although it does seem to have, it seems to hint at some kind of Shadow of Mordor style. Mm. Uh, Crime network, which you can take down, but I don't know how. Yeah, how it works. yeah they should have a lot of lines connecting a lot of buildings without ever explaining what any of them, which is yeah. what a wizard would do. It's like they're trying to sell us these games, and who knows? About it's apparently, what it's going to blow up your idea of video games. Oh, not again! <laughs> I think it's like blow up the way you play games. Oh, no, is that like right? it implied that whatever you currently get pleasure from, you'll no longer be able to get pleasure <laughs> from? It's all over now. Yeah, that was uh, that was an. Ex- a lovely bit of tech, though, because as we were saying, we were watching it just before the podcast. It looks just chunky enough to be believable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the way the yeah, physics just kind of slightly clips into itself is actually not a problem, but just you know, exciting in the sense that actually that looks legit. Uh, what about Halo Wars Two, which is a Windows Ten exclusive? Oh god, apparently. Yeah. Well, for PC, <laughs> obviously. It's but it's by Creative Assembly. Yes, yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Which is exciting. Uh, I know so little about Halo Wars, the first one. Was it 2009? Was it made by Ensemble Studios? Uh, I forget who it was made by, who were quickly Ensemble. shuttered afterwards, I'm afraid. Yeah, they, they, uh, shut, they closed down. I, was, was it console only, Halo Wars? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was meant to be, there was a period uh, where, uh, so for some reason, people making console games decided they really wanted to crack that, that problem and <laughs> make an RTS, RTS for the console. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, there are a few. Well, you just don't bother. Just I, make a different game. Yeah. <laughs> it briefly became my sideline was reviewing RTSs on consoles oh, because really? the console guys didn't have any RTS people. Mm. <laughs> they could only really give the complete outsider's perspective. So I reviewed like Supreme Commander on console and um, Supreme Commander 2 and one other, I can't remember what it was. But none of them work. <laughs> we did play one which had a kind of a cool um, kind of unit selection thing where you kind of flick the analogue uh, stick in a direction. Your kind of control would leap to whatever movement to whatever oh, yeah. unit was uh, in mm-hmm. that direction. Um, I think Topcon Two, you could kind of like paint what you wanted to select. Mm-hmm. So you sort of smeared around some selection juice. <laughs> and then when you released the thing, it would yeah. select everything that would be coated in your selection of like juice. <laughs> yeah. I gather that's how Halo Wars worked as well. <laughs> uh, really? You just you just use an analog stick to gesture at the thing and smear it in selection juice. Um, <laughs> what do you think about being uh, Windows 10 exclusive then? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I, th- I think that by, it's due out later to, in late 2016. So hopefully by then everyone will have uncovered the various ways in which Windows 10 will try and steal your data. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds fun terrifying. Off the internet, which does sound terrifying. It has complete access to everything you type. <laughs> oh my god! In order to build it's, uh, dictionaries, it says, but it's still, <laughs> still kind of sending that data off somewhere. I don't, don't want that. Yeah, I, don't I think when all this stuff came out, okay. it became immediately apparent why Windows 10 is free. 
to me like it, it's, it's like, fucking they, virus <laughs> they, they get like they they just gain so much information out of the people that are using mm. it all the time and that that is just valuable data even if they turn that into a product or just sell it on that's mm. that's hugely valuable i'll upgrade to it uh at the same time uh at the same point that i upgraded to windows 8 which is never <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Die on Windows Seven, fuck you! I, I can't, I can't risk it because it took them three years to uh, get compatibility with my Wacom tablet working with Windows Seven properly. <laughs> so I don't want to. No, I want to risk waiting three years for my yeah, tablet to work. Again. They've really trained me not to trust or buy their new products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. I think the uh, Windows Ten thing is the the kind of uh, the wrist lock they have on you is DirectX Twelve. Mm. And when games start requiring that, which is of course exclusive to uh, Windows Ten. Yeah, I mean, so the, when. The big Vista exclusive that caused so much um, pain was Just Cause 2, right? Mm. And Just Cause 3 is on the horizon now, so I really hope they don't make that oh, God, DX12 yeah. exclusive. Mm. Mm. It feels like there are just certain companies out there who are like, weak to Microsoft's attacks. <laughs> <laughs> just do whatever Microsoft wants. Uh, Homefront, the revolution. <laughs> Really? Didn't it looks like... Them. But yeah, well, the, the previous Homefronts are rubbish, obviously, but, you know, this mm. looks like uh, it's... Uh, Far Cry Three, basically, but in a in a city with uh, with like, more misery and casual racism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more <laughs> casual racism. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> what? I'm kind of fine with that. <laughs> like, the premise doesn't bother me. It's just, uh, but based on the clips they're showing, like the execution of it doesn't look like, terribly exciting. So, as a shooter, it doesn't look very exciting. Yeah, well, I wondered if that was. The look speed on it seemed really, really insanely slow. Mm. Like when you were turning, which was like uh, so. That's obviously something you can adjust. So I don't know if actual combat's going to be as sluggish as it looks there, yeah. whether they they were doing that because maybe that makes better video. If people are twitching around all the time, it probably doesn't make a good kind of cinema. Was this completely unannounced before today? No, I think we all knew it's it was happening okay. ages. Yeah, because I, I met someone who was working on it at. Um, uh, develop and I wondered afterwards was he supposed to tell me he was working on that because I hadn't heard it yeah. existed it supposedly has some sort of territorial fighty over places mechanics territorial <laughs> <laughs> fighty over places this is it's Far Cry 3's um, this is like base capture stuff base capture yeah, yeah, exactly like yeah, that's that. what, that's fun. That's fun. and apparently the different factions will fight independently of oh, you oh, uh, I like that I like the sound of that as well it's just really fucking brown it did look quite brown yeah oh. uh, we happy few oh yeah I quite like the look of that yeah, spooky, spooky mm. kind of Bioshocky vibe to it. Not quite sure exactly what the structure of the game is, but you seem to be wandering around being menaced by people in smiling masks. Yeah, you set in London. Looks like you live in a sort of pseudo utopian society where everyone's got to be happy all the time, and mm. everyone else is either happy or wearing a mask that makes them look happy. But then they they beat you up, <laughs> <laughs> probably for not smiling enough. Yeah, I don't know what what else that game is about, really. <laughs> but uh, it seems like a good jumping off point. Yeah, yeah, like like good yeah, it's a good trailer that. as well. Yeah, good voice. Uh, do we want to talk about Quantum Break, even though that's not a PC game? Yeah, I mean, it's just like Remedy of a good legacy of stuff on PC. Mm-hmm. So they might bring it to PC, then. Yeah, it might well do, yeah. I, I mean, personally, I, I thought it was really boring. <laughs> but maybe I've, I have no soul anymore. It's just, it was a third-person cover shooter where you've got time manipulation elements. And a lot of games have tried this. And those include, like, kind of time domes where the time will slow down in those areas. And some, sometimes the entire action, the whole battlefield seems to freeze and fluctuate. And the vi- vision looks amazing when that happens. Like mm. The effects they're using for that stuff is uh, spectacular. And you then tell... you take cover and <laughs> yeah. you fire over the cover. <laughs> fire uh... your assault rifle over the cover at the armed guards who are firing their assault rifles at you. So you use this beautiful, amazing kind of time grenade to freeze a guard. And then you just straight around him and shoot him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that, like, there's half an interesting idea there. <laughs> so those fights take place in a, uh, like time pause state where like everyone's paused except you and you're running around and then the time cops show up and everyone's paused except <laughs> you and the time cops hmm. but also it looks like the time cops teleport at times hmm. yeah, so you can and I wonder if that's yeah. not teleportation but they are pausing time relative to you and moving while you're not hmm. looking because <laughs> yes. that would be hilarious if there's a third time scale <laughs> which <laughs> yeah. both of you have paused time relative to the rest of the world and they pause time relative to you yeah, I don't know what the uh, the in-game excuse for that is. It does look cool, though. Mm. I, I, I like games which play time powers. Time shift is actually an unexpectedly great... I don't, I don't retract that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unexpectedly interesting shooter mm. with interesting techniques that has obviously got a really botched and horrible development. Um, it looks ugly as fuck. But all the, all the stuff that they do in that game with kind of moment-to-moment time powers is really consistent and they really you know go through with it. Whereas... 
uh, what's the Singularity, a game mm. by Raven, which also has time powers, only uses them in very specific context sensitive places, and it mm. feels like they just backed away from the idea because they knew it, they couldn't cope with the way it would break the game if they mm. allowed you to play with time all over the place. Yeah, it's not very satanic. Quantum Break looked to me like that won't be either because it's no. so they just portray these time houses random almost like things just flicker in and out of existence and sometimes you see the future and sometimes you don't and sometimes this will time lapse mm. forwards and sometimes it won't and it feels like that's you sort of you establish early on that there aren't consistent rules to this so then you've got the excuse to do any kind of cutscene you want to do like mm. when player walks into here and now we can show him this incredible vista or this weird flash forward that will give him some clues to the plot Aiden and then we can never have to do that again yeah. <laughs> you know non-specific accent probably <laughs> I enjoy uh, like Remedy have always had kind of an, an interesting approach to like plots and mm. they often have a, a very good sense interesting sense of humour that I'd, I'd be excited to see how that is exercised through a kind of time travel tra- like scenario so yeah that's why I'd be interested in that probably also, not going to, is it, will, it, will it come to PC? very nice I tell you what is coming to PC and does have time slowing in it oh yes Cobalt oh yes which yeah. is great hooray it is great made by but, friends of ours actually we but. played that Mm. Our PC gamer, yeah, like, yeah it seemed like years ago. It feels like now. Yeah, but it was kind of like uh, the de facto office game for a while, yeah, wasn't it? It was really fun. The um, trailer they released today was um, incredibly beautiful in a like sort of technical way. Like it's just it's the game we've already played, and the sprites right. look really nice, and it's kind of a particularly well put together trailer. Um, but also just like the the titles they put layer over it, and the way those um, kind of squish in and squish out again. And the whole thing is actually. I think YouTube might have improved their playback for 60 FPS stuff recently. They've, mm-hmm. you know, they've had 60 FPS for a while, but this is like, I think the first trailer I ever watched where um, it was just like completely perfect. Like I could have been playing the game on the best machine in the world, mm-hmm. and it would have looked mm-hmm. like that. There's been some uh, Street Fighter Five ones like that recently, just very recently that have absolutely like so smooth. So yeah, it's funny. I yeah. never would have said that I was annoyed at trailers dropping frames or mm. things being slightly inconsistent or something but they obviously work as soon as you see it doing perfectly it's like well holy shit yeah, it's so much better. <laughs> this looks like the best thing in the world uh, one of my favourite things about Cobalt is that you're, you reflect projectiles or certain projectiles at least while you're rolling Yeah. Uh, and the game goes into slow motion if you're in peril and I think the slow motion scales to the number of people who are in peril in a yeah. given area <laughs> uh, so if an explosion is going off and there are like five people near it it will go almost like almost stop and <laughs> so you get to precisely see who dies and how and also gives everyone the opportunity to roll and deflect things in really virtual ways I tried to do something a bit like this in Heat Signature recently and it totally mm. backfired which is um, when a ship launches a missile at you I thought okay the smart way to do this is um, people getting destroyed immediately and didn't know why so I thought, okay, time's going to go slow when they fire a missile at you, but it's going to go slower the closer the missile gets, because in my head that seemed really tense. Like, you know, mm. if they launch it at you from a while away, we don't slow down at all. As it gets closer, we start to go super slow-mo, and it's like Peggle with the ball going near the thing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if only this could be as cinematic as Peggle. <laughs> yeah. um, but the problem is, if you smoothly ramp down time at the same rate that the missile is approaching you, then it seems like the missile is just staying still, <laughs> and, like, you... All you notice is that you can't move as fast as you could before. So it felt like missiles were like ensnaring you. <laughs> like every time a missile got close, you felt huh. just trapped. That must be a trick of perspective then, as much as anything, because uh, Cobalt slows down and zooms in on uh, areas of action where you can still see the rocket moving because you're already close. So that must give you the context. You yeah, it's good. it's because uh, stupid. And I certainly am in space where you have no frame <laughs> of reference for anything. So yeah. you, if you're going at you know 300 miles an hour and it's going at 290 miles an hour, it feels like you're both static. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you should scrap that part of the game. Just switch it to, to, to <laughs> put it on a <laughs> put it in cobalt's <laughs> levels. You just kind of weave your way between the geometry. <laughs> yeah, it does look good. And uh, every time I meet the, those guys, I'm like, "Oh yeah, how's uh, how's cobalt going?" And then they get this kind of distant, slightly pained look in them. <laughs> they admit the new massive feature that they've been adding for the last six months, like entire single player game. And you know, uh, really, they do. Yeah, well, well we, I think so. Yeah, we kind of played it like um, uh, like. Nidhogg or Samurai Garn or sort of one of those mm. local multiplayer games. I mean, mm. we're, we're playing online but we're all in the same room and stuff and it's a great like couch really deathmatch yeah. game but there is a whole single player campaign there's a co-op mode there's mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff yeah so have you guys been watching the, the International the Dotes International which Chris is currently at enjoying his birthday yes I um uh I started watching it when it started, just like to see the opening ceremony. And Gabe came on stage, and um, it's always like a, l- a little bit um, 
exciting just to see Gabe in any context because he actually doesn't like he's not that visible really like mm. the, his biggest the most he's probably said in the last few years publicly has been like a talk to an econo- economics class in a mm. university <laughs> and uh, so it's quite rare to see him actually sort of come out and address um, the community and he does so for about 40 seconds <laughs> and just says explains why that why the international is the highlight of the year for a lot of our people and then just says well you don't want to listen to me talking you want to watch some games of Dota and then just leaves uh, and it's great <laughs> and you think oh that's the perfect way to start and then it cuts to announcers and they say well we've got a lot to get through and they break down how they're going to talk about the international last year for like half an hour <laughs> and then all this other stuff so I kind of tuned out and I came back like an hour and a bit later and it still hasn't started and so I thought it had a massively overlong and stupid opening ceremony but apparently I think they had technical difficulties is that right? Uh, I didn't notice any before the thing started, but that would explain why it took them so long to get going. Yeah. Um, like, uh, the first few matches seemed to be fine, uh, but then during the second series, there was a break in one of the games that lasted almost an hour, where yeah. uh, the the streams just seemed to go down completely. Uh, all the streams, apart from the French stream, uh, and the French stream started playing Darude. Wearing, wearing top hats Sandstorm. and then they got a, a dog in and they became internet celebrities <laughs> overnight because of the way they, they handled the Dota downtime I didn't know this. Uh, and it, that was by far that's the only reason I just kept, kept watching so who was wearing hats? oh this is the, the French streamers who are like host, uh, streaming the, the international for French audiences oh ok so they have like a separate casters booth or Different. Um yeah they, they seemed like a, it looked like they were streaming out of their front room somewhere else <laughs> entirely uh, but they were definitely they definitely seemed to be part of the international coverage right. uh, and I think the Russian stream was up and they were up uh, and obviously the game was paused because the, the players had stopped playing because they knew that all the streams had gone down right. and they seemed to be having land difficulties um, generally uh, but so yes they, they the, French, the French guys they stepped up during the hour long delay one of the presenters um, made a great tweet that was uh, said uh, who is Phil and why do they want us to talk about him <laughs> <laughs> it takes a second they uh there was a lot of despair on Twitter because Valve didn't communicate very well what was going on, by which I mean at all, <laughs> <laughs> to to anyone. <laughs> so uh, the, um, the stream would go up for a minute and then down again, okay. and then it would go up for for casters again, and then the players would leave the left the booths at one point, and everyone in the in- arena was tweeting, "They're leaving the booth, they're leaving the booth. This is a disaster!" And then everyone on the internet was just losing their shits, and the Twitch <laughs> chat was just gone crazy, and they were rioting. Uh, and then, like the players, obviously they're just gone for a toilet break or something. <laughs> uh, they came back like ten minutes later and said, "Oh, the international is saved. It's going to be <laughs> fine. Everything's okay again." And then the match started, and everyone was just really excited to watch the Dota again. Uh, but it was it was a pretty big wobble for uh, such a, a big tournament. But what about the Dota itself? Oh, because uh, we <laughs> our expert <laughs> opinion with uh, this is great. Here. I watched. Uh, so I watched the first. I'm not sure what terminology is. <laughs> like it begins. game uh, around. <laughs> yes, that is what Dota is. Three. What is a match and what is a game? Which one is the shorter one? <laughs> it's the best of three. It, it, tennis oh, terms. What are, like, what are the individual things? Called? If we could use tennis terms, then a game is the smaller one and the match is the okay. One. So I watched the first match of three games. Okay. And um, it was pretty good. I, I followed it most of the way through and then afterwards I found out that that was apparently by itself better than the entire international last year. Oh, wow. And also the best game of the day which the day was 13 hours long in the end. <laughs> and so I did the right thing by watching that one and going to bed. <laughs> yeah, maybe I watched that. I, I, just to say, Chris has prepared a massive cheat sheet for all of the kind of teams and everything you need to expect from the, from, from the dotes. So I might link that in the show notes even though it'll probably be mostly over by the time. Yeah. But that, that is... A- that is essential because they don't give you any of that mm. like, uh, if you're watching it they don't give you uh, like they do some little documentaries around the players and things but they don't give you here is mm. the current meta and here is why this hero is always banned and here is why this hero is super important now there is the um, the noob stream which is what I was watching oh, yeah. where they do like a, an alternate commentary and those are like that's official that's people at the um, event itself and uh, did, did you really get a good. sense as to why the uh, that particular match was awesome then yeah I mean it had a lot of back and forth it was a Best of three, they went to three matches, which is, I mean, I guess that's a spoiler. <laughs> <You know, laughs> yeah. I assume anyone who's mega into Dota has probably watched at least that by now. Um, and it had uh, just some interesting games where like one team would take a really early lead and then just fuck it up, just like makes one yeah. massive mistake and then keep making a series of smaller mistakes after that and then really get to the point where you know the other team is going to crush them utterly. And that was quite interesting. And in two of the games... Um, they, you really got to see like the carry concept 
played out in a way that even I could understand. Like, they're always talking about mm. the carry, and the carry is like the person on your team where you let them get all the experience and all the gold, and you, everyone else is just trying to get that person to level up. And I actually don't know which sense of the word carry it's named after, because you carry them, and then mm. after a while they carry you, because they become so powerful that they, mm. you just rely on them utterly. And in one of those games, um, uh, one team had a guy with a big pike, I can't remember his name, Phantom Lancer, I think, oh. um, who can clone himself. And he's like a really kind of tall guy with a really big weapon. And his animation is kind of interesting. This is the kind of thing I would look at when I'm watching a Doctor Match. Is the animation of that character is interesting because he kind of he doesn't attack that often. Um, and when he does, it's a massive motion, but he does it incredibly quickly. So it has this really kind of weird, jerky, kind of um, awkward look to it. Uh, that I'm sure is probably a consequence of like the Warcraft three animation system or something, <laughs> like somewhere back in the history. <laughs> Um, but when you have like six or seven of copies of him all doing that thing and he's um, I think it, the game lasted 50 minutes which is abnormally long um, and obviously if you are if you have a character who's a carry and they're being leveled up all that time then by 50 minutes they just become a sort of complete god mm. and the commenters are just saying oh, there's just no way to kill this person no matter how much damage you put on them they will just always survive it and there's seven of him <laughs> and seeing that surround like a tower and they're all hitting it with their weird pikes and they're all going in this weird jerky motion and you see its health bar get completely crushed it was quite a spectacle and um, you did see like everyone pile on him and he's like get injured but just never really close to death and that was kind of entertaining to watch to see like that it get to that situation where one person is that much more powerful than everyone else because uh, the rest of the time I just can't tell what the fuck is going on really. I see the effects and I see oh that guy I can't even really tell when someone's stunned but <laughs> I pretend to right? he hasn't moved in a while he's probably stunned <laughs> there was a great moment where someone got stuck in some trees I think someone must have cast a spell at, like on him which created trees or it, it sounded like it was his own fault like he'd done it to himself and he got literally just physically stuck in the tree so that he couldn't get out and none of his teammates could get him out either. And he had to call his donkey to deliver him a teleport scroll. <laughs> and it took like two minutes for this thing to like, I don't even know if it was a donkey, but one of the couriers to trot all the way across <laughs> the map to bring him a scroll so he could teleport out of the tree he was stuck in. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> Phantom Lancer is great to watch because his um, doppelgangers, when they attack enemy heroes, they drain their mana. So it's uh, really cool in team fights because you see them like they'll just sap the manner of them like all the most dangerous enemy heroes until they just can't don't have enough you know to cast any spells or anything. So there's loads of kind of aspects that heroes that, that are really interesting. And once you start learning what they all do, you start recognizing how fucking amazingly skillful the people involved <laughs> are at doing them. Um, there's a, a great hero. The first game was amazing because there was just some really exciting heroes in it. Uh, one of the Storm Spirit who has is this kind of electrical uh, god. Who has this incredible mobility? You can just like become a lightning bolt and zip across the map, <laughs> and he use that to go like up into the enemy base if he wants to, or just up onto the high ground anywhere anywhere he wants to go. He just seems like he can he can get there if he has the mana and he has the right items. Uh, and he also has this ability to kind of when someone's getting away from him, he can kind of wheel them back. He like ropes them back <laughs> with electricity, and he can also just zap the fuck out of them uh, just to do loads of damage anyway. And watching uh, that guy just zip around and kind of contain people and just be incredibly precise with his movements and who he's going for was really exciting. The other guy was Axe, who's this giant red dude with a big fucking axe, you'd be surprised to hear. I think that's Chris's favourite character. Oh, really? Yeah. He's amazing to watch because his special, his um, super move is uh, an enormous dunk, as they say in Dota Parts, <laughs> which is just a massive amount of damage that just deletes you from the game. Uh, and uh, if someone's below a certain percentage of health and you hit them with uh, Axe's special, it just fucking deletes them. <laughs> it's like you've just gone from the game. And there are abilities, like there's one called Shadow Grave that's designed to keep you alive, no matter how much damage you take. But because the rule of Axe is, uh, special isn't that it doesn't damage, it just deletes them. If they're below a certain amount, <laughs> it just goes through that. So you'll see people like, they kept alive with the Shadow Grave and Axe will just come in and dunk. The best thing about it is that if you successfully dunk, the ability instantly recharges. Oh, wow. And yeah. it allows for these chain reactions, uh, of which one happened where he just blinked into the enemy base up to where two guys were just below the kind of the, the, the portion of health that Dunk he could get. And he, he, he just dunked one, dunked the other, and blinked out just in <laughs> like under a second. It was insane to watch. And if you have no idea what's going on, then that's just, you, you wouldn't even notice it. That he just, uh, just, yeah, I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so two heroes just disappear off the map, and that's just Axe doing what Axe does when he's amazing. Uh, but it also just reminds me about how, uh, just, I, I can never play that game. <laughs> I could never do anything. You could never double dunk. I could never double dunk. <laughs> I could barely single dunk, I've discovered. <laughs> There's bots and rubbish. But I think the that match was super exciting, and I love watching Dota, actually. Uh, 
the kind of ebb and flow of power and the back and forth between teams is really interesting and subtle. Um, and there are ways for teams to come back if they've drafted the right type sort of heroes. So there's a, a hero called the Anti Mage, which gets huge, but he it like gets super huge maybe at the 17 minute mark, at the point where to the extent that he just breaks the game <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> as Tom was describing. But there are the heroes that kind of uh, they 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 peak at different times in the match, and that's yeah. really really interesting. That seems to just dominate the flow of play is, is when certain heroes peak and if you kind of don't execute if you don't like push for objectives while your heroes are, uh, are at that peak then you lose which is what happened in the first game with Empire where they were they were their heroes were peaking and they had this amazing chance to they were just basically dominating the game but they got really greedy and aggressive and just went right into the base and got picked off and suddenly the, the massive swing happened and that meant they couldn't attack for 10 minutes. And by the ten minutes, time 10 minutes were up, the other heroes were peaking on the enemy team. And by that time, it was too late, pretty much, because the carries had gotten too, too fat yeah. on the other side. And that ever flow of power is super interesting, and I've never seen a game that operates like that. Um, it's funny, it's really I, interesting. I still can't really see that happen. I mean, I look at the net worth of players and the, the mm. total kills and stuff, and that's the only thing I have to go on, really. Whereas in StarCraft 2, which I also don't play, and also couldn't <laughs> play to any degree of competence... Um, I see things like that happen, like the the, the sin of over committing mm. and of pushing your luck and then getting punished and like super punished for it and mm. losing the whole game on it. When I see that happen in StarCraft 2, I can kind of see it happening. Whereas in Dota, I hear the commentators saying it ha- it's happening. I'm like, okay, I'm sure that's happening. <laughs> I see that the numbers are going up in that way. It's not until the, like team fights happen that you suddenly see that the carry mm. does actually execute that power. Yeah, that was yeah, that's kind of what I was saying earlier. Like the the, the carry thing was nice for me because it was the one thing I could actually visually understand. Mm. Like I see that the bright pink guy is not going away; he's still <laughs> there. <Yeah. laughs> Other people, I don't know whether they came or went, but that guy's definitely still there. <laughs> I, um, I, mean, I think as a spectacle, it's it's great if you know enough about the game. I also love the stage they had uh, they've got at the international this year. Oh yeah, they had like light effects showing the spell effects, right? Yeah, they're in two uh, opposing booths and they're on a, a square platform that is the map of Dota. <laughs> and the booths are positioned where the agents are positioned on the map. And whenever a spell goes off, the spell effect blasts across the map. It's projected on the, like from the, the ceiling uh, from one booth to the other. So if you see a sonic wave, the sonic wave will, will explode across the arena and uh, attack them. I feel like it's one step away from just projecting the game down onto the stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the players could like just peer over their desk and say, oh look, he's over there. <laughs> Uh, that that's that's fantastic. I think the bit my biggest problem with it is that it's impossible to watch it if you <laughs> have a job <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. it's so long. Uh, it's so many games and well, they, they go on and on. Apparently, like the arena itself was emptying before the final match was over mm. because of that big delay that they had and it just went really long to the night. People have been there for. Mm. Chris said 13 hours hmm. and surely, people just yeah. left <laughs> surely they could whittle it down to a fewer than 16 teams mm. like, yeah I was thinking that Like it seems like it's too many for me to keep track of in it? previous years it hasn't been that many has it or, or has no, it I'm, I'm not, not sure I couldn't say I only really pay attention to who the teams are like at the final stages mm. that's when it's, there's few enough for me to understand but yeah there's probably an argument for that being the international you know when it's down to wait to make it the international I mean they had the group stages which lasted all week last week and I I caught as much as I could of those matches and uh, basically it was impossible to pass the only reason I got anything out of it at all was because there were these brilliant daily reddit posts on the Dota reddit which gave you a top 5 games to watch in in order of excitement and that's that's, like there is so much and I only saw like a tiny fraction of the games Uh, and it feels like kind of a shame because there's so much skill on display and there's Mm. so much exciting stuff to watch that there's just no way to physically watch it <laughs> uh, and for that to carry like I, I, I don't think the f- so the final stage is an entire week this week so it's, it's like, uh, it goes on until Saturday I'm pretty sure that wasn't the case in previous internationals so I'm pretty sure they, the final fling of it was over a sh- short smaller oh. period but I have to ask Chris when he uh, gives us his errata of corrections <laughs> yes <laughs> and special episode reset. special hour and a half long episode <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but anyway that's uh, be like, it's not your birthday now shut up <laughs> Uh, yeah, so those are my uh, amateur. Oh, see, I can ask you a question about uh, uh, mobile etiquette. Mm. I had a very strange game just before the podcast with Richard uh, uh, of Hots, and uh, uh, I, it was one of these games where you get to pick heroes. It was in the, the Hero League version of it, so I, I was first pick, so I picked a, a tank character I particularly like, and the second person to pick also picked a tank character. And then later in the match, we realised we didn't have nearly enough damage output. Mm. Um, which was predictable because as soon as he picked that, we both, both me and Rich went, "Why has he done that?" Mm. And uh, but he was complaining in chat about how we didn't have enough damage output. <laughs> so Rich, Rich kind of politely just said, "Mate, you you picked a tank second after a tank had already been picked," mm. and he was like, 
No, I picked first. <laughs> How did, what do you do with that? How do you... Is there any point? Is it conceivable? <laughs> it's possible you could have seen it. Picked at the same time, like, and it was like there's a massive well, lag pretty, or something. Pretty clear. <laughs> like, my name is big and above his, and then his portrait. Mm. Mm. And he picked it like twenty seconds after I picked mine. Anyway, does, so it, I, <laughs> does everyone see that stuff come through the same yeah. same order? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's the same. But like, if That's somebody like somebody's just not on the same level of reality with you, mm. how how can you negotiate with them about you have tactics? To yeah. Call them. A <laughs> <laughs> like aspersions about their mother you get a racial epithet in there that'd be good right yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure you hit on the, like, the central problem with it with like I can one of the reasons I can, can't face going into Dota is that I'd love to play it in an organised context where mm. I'm with my friends and we've all got roles and stuff but that's that's it's impossible to organise online yeah. in a public environment it's to, so the game doesn't really function surely it functions on, on some sort of level where you're just kind of going around on your own like sharks and trying to get as accidentally get a win but it feels yeah. like you're not really playing the game is, is no like I mean I'm at the level now where I have good games and bad games and sometimes they totally suck but the thing that is always preventing me from winning is ultimately team mm. teamwork or lack of mm. Yeah, I mean this is my entire Team Fortress 2 career <laughs> <laughs> right. I almost never played it except in random you know public games um, and it was frustrating sometimes um I think the way with that game, it's probably not as, or certainly not as as um, team dependent as like Dota, where if you, if you're the dead weight on a team, you're actively destroying your team. <laughs> um, hmm. But I tended to just like prefer smaller matches in the end. Like once I started to care about how well we did, I would just pick matches of like three v three or what, no, not like more like five or six v six. Um, and on that kind of team, if you're good, you can actually determine the outcome a little bit you don't need everyone to be doing their job perfectly yeah. games what well, yeah. other games have you been playing Tom mm, Francis I've still been playing Endless Legend but it <laughs> cool is Endless, about Endless Legend so. is, <laughs> like TF2 it is um, basically a different game depending on who you play as like it's just there are like five races or six races and that is five or six different games um and so last time we talked about it, I just played as the Peace Lizards, and mm. I'd used the Peace Lizards to make peace with the only other race in the game, which was the also peace the Peace Lizards. <laughs> <laughs> and I conquered all the territories around them, made peace with them, and then declared closed borders so they couldn't leave their own territory. Um, and that worked, but then, as I said last time, like I was going for a diplomatic victory, but all you get... The only way to reach that is you just get a certain number of diplomacy points. And I got some for making peace, and I got some for being in peace. And he was getting some diplomacy points for being in peace as well, but I, I was slightly ahead of him because I made the first move. Um, and that was going to be okay. There was no other way for him to get more points than me, so it was just going to eventually win. But it was going to take, like, a year <laughs> of real time. <laughs> it was just absurdly slow. I was, like, 18% of the way there after 100 turns or something. And I was like, that's just my life if I want that to happen. It's never going to happen. Um, and so I ended up going for an economic victory. Because it turns out the economic victory is a certain amount of money. you just got to make a certain amount of money. But, brilliantly, it doesn't, detra- it doesn't subtract the amount you spent all you've got to do is earn that amount of money in total. All the money that's ever come into you in any form, mm. even if you spent it right away, huh. it still counts towards that total. And it's like a quarter of a million or something. Um, but I realised, actually, that's one thing, unlike diplomacy points, where it will rise exponentially. The more money I get, the more money I can spend on things that make money. And because the spending of the money to make money doesn't count against your total, it's just rocketing. So I just ended up completely retooling my entire empire uh, to a massive money-making machine <laughs> and just hit that way before my diplomacy victory. So I won that on money. And then I was going to play as the roving clans next, which are the, the nomadic traders who get a cut of everyone's transactions on the open market and um, have a couple of other like commerce-related things. Uh, but because I just played as the peace lizards, when I got to the actual empire selection screen, I was suddenly very tempted by the necrophages, <laughs> who are the... <laughs> They're like a cross between the Zerg and Nurgle. <laughs> oh, right. So, Zergle. <laughs> they are uh, insectoid aliens, but they also spread disease everywhere they go. And they, um, their only mission is just to destroy everyone. Um, I think they can't ever make peace with anyone. And they can't even talk to the minor languages. Like You can't do quests for them or anything like that because you just can't speak to them in any way. If only and they... you can talk to the Zergle. <laughs> <laughs> the description for that racial trait is um, uh, 
you don't talk to your next meal. <laughs> <laughs> and so they just spread throughout the land, just uh, consuming everyone. Um, I think they... So anyway, the, their, their main hero is quite powerful in combat, and I uh, just spread out really quickly, took loads of territories, and then focused on like making a good like death ball army, just having my hero and all my starting units and a couple of new units I produced in the same ball and then attacking cities and for most of the game until the very late game the most people you can have in, a, in an army is six so I made an army of six units and I attacked the nearest city and um, just went straight for it killed all the defenders uh, took the city and you automatically capture it um, you actually can't raise it because you're not allowed to raise a city unless you have total control of it and once you, when you've just conquered an enemy city it's kind of in rebellion automatically like a certain percentage of those people don't um, uh, really follow you so you can't burn it down um, and that didn't matter too much but weirdly after I conquered it I took my army of six people out again and they were eight people now <laughs> and I looked in the like the post battle screen that, t that says who died and who lived none of my people died because I had a really good army and two people just were in my army now who weren't there before <laughs> and it turns out I had this unit called a proliferator which I, I just got it because it was a ranged unit and I like ranged units but it turns out what it does is anyone it um, anyone it kills after the battle becomes like a pustule zombie on your side um, I think they're called the battle worn and they're just like yeah tough melee zombies with um, hideous parasites all over them <laughs> and weirdly they don't count against your army cap well they kind of they do but it won't stop them from being added to your army so instead of being six out of six units i was eight out of six huh. and then i once i realized this i was like well i should just like pick every fight i can like on my way to the next enemy city attack everyone i possibly can there's intercept like marauding monsters attack enemy troops who are who have factions i'm not even fighting at the moment and so i did and each time it would add like one or two extra units to my death ball. Oh my god. And ended up with like 27 out of 6. <laughs> <laughs> well, this seems kind of unbeatable. Because <laughs> you, can't, you can't join like that army of 6. You can have another army of 6, but they can't attack at the same time. You can't have them both in the same battle. Um, and so no one else is necrophages. No one else can do this. And so I'm the only person who has a single unit that can that has this kind of strength. And obviously if you massively out overpower your opponent, you don't really get any casualties. Um... And I'm auto-resolving all of these battles, by the way, because it just takes... It does have a, a tactical battle mode, but it's uh, absurdly slow. It just is going to take all of your day. Um, and it's not... It's all right, but it's not. doesn't really add that much. It's If I was making this game, I would not have done a battle mode at all. I would have just had auto-resolve. Um, and it was going great. And I, I just attacked the nearest faction. I was playing on a four-player map because uh, previously I'd only played on one on two, one v one um, and with the peace lizards that caused a problem because the only other faction turned out to be the peace lizards and we wanted the same thing so nothing really happened to that game <laughs> we just made peace and then eventually I won um, so I thought okay you've got to have more than one other po opponent in a 4x game otherwise loads of like diplomacy things don't really matter and um, uh, all that stuff but 4v4 on a small map instead of tiny and on easy instead of newbie turned out to be uh, a bad combination and that actually I don't think the AI difficulty is a problem at all and I don't even think the map size uh, no the map size was a problem it was it just got to the point where I defeated one race really quickly and then there were two others left and the red and the orange and I started attacking the red and I destroyed their capital and I destroyed a bunch of other, the other territories but they still have like four other territories and the orange had about eight or ten territories I had about eight or ten territories and I could I could have just carried on attacking the red and eliminated every last one of their territories, but I was getting a bit bored of just conquering all their things. So I switched my attention to the orange faction and started attacking them. And uh, at some point, I destroyed the red's capital, and it popped up with a message saying, you are now one capital away from a supremacy victory, which means if you're the only race who still has your capital, you win automatically. Hmm. And it doesn't matter who destroyed the other capitals, it doesn't matter why you have that, um, you could do nothing at all and just hang on to your capital. If everyone else loses theirs, then you win. Um, and so it also popped up saying, Orange is uh, one capital away from a supremacy victory. 
And what happened is I destroyed one race outright, so I destroyed their capital, obviously. I destroyed the Reds' capital without really knowing it. And so now the, the Reds, I don't think they can ever... I wonder if... I don't know what happens if they take it back, but they're never really going to take it back. Um, and uh, I think it wouldn't count anyway. So it was like, okay, I'm actually close to victory. I can just find the Orange's capital, then I can destroy it. But also, if they destroy my capital now, I'm fucked. And uh, I... The problem was I didn't know what their capital was. I'd scattered most of the map, but, like, there's an icon next to your capital that tells you it's your capital, but you only see it when you're actually seeing the city, like, when it's in your vision range now. So even though I discovered every city they ever had, I didn't notice oh, where I knew which one was right. the capital. So I had That's no idea which one to thing, go for. It? Yeah, there's no... I can't think of a good reason for it, because the capital can't change. Um, so uh, I was trying to find it for ages, and then I got to a... Um, uh, I think they, I can't remember what they said to me, but the, the Orange faction made uh, contact and had some, probably some treaty, like, oh, I think they begged for peace. <laughs> <That was it. laughs> they, even though I wasn't really winning the war, um, they didn't like that they were in war and wanted to make peace with me. I just pretty much destroyed the Reds by that point, and I was coming after them. And um, <clears throat> they, uh, yeah, wanted peace, and they were willing to, like, pay for it. Um I don't know how it works. I guess I, I would have been allowed to do that. I wasn't going to do it. But um, even though my race can't offer peace, I think you can probably accept peace if someone else offers it. Um, but in that trade screen, um, it showed me a list of all their cities and it showed me which one was their capital. So then I knew the name of their capital and I could go back to the map and find it. But also during that trade screen, I just thought, I wonder if... Like, the reason it pops up is because that's one of the things you can trade for when they're, when they're offering for peace. No way. Because it's such an extreme situation. Like, you might be, you might have your, you know, two towns left and they've got conquered the whole other map. And at that stage, maybe peace would be worth giving them one of your towns. <laughs> and so it's the only time you can actually offer a city in trade. And I just thought, <laughs> I wonder if you'd give me your capital. <laughs> but probably not. Like, in Galsiv, you can do this as well. You can give away planets and offer them in trade. But the AI just never goes for it. Like, no matter how much you offer, they'll never give you even their worst, shittiest planet. Not for all of your planets ever. <laughs> like, it's just 100% no. I don't even know why it's in the game. Um, <laughs> but in this case, so I was clicking on, okay, I want your capital. I only want your capital. You have all your other, plan all your other planets, uh, territories. Um, and I'm going to give you all of my money, all of my luxury resources, all of my strategic resources, a bunch of my units. I'm going to give you all these awesome war technologies, like, you know, not only good technologies, which they pay a lot for anyway, but also, like, military technologies, which usually no one ever trades. Um, give you all of those, and I'll give you some of my cities. I'll give you this city, and, the, like, it shows you as you're offering these things what their disposition is, and it's 100% negative. <laughs> so mm. I'll give you this city, 100% negative. I'll give you this city, 100% negative. I'll give you this city. And all my cities clicking them, clicking them, clicking them. And then I clicked on one of them, and it went to 100% positive. Like, what? You'll take this? This wins me the game. <laughs> I, I won't say this to you, but <laughs> I'm thinking, this, uh, this trade wins me the game instantaneously. And I know I'm offering you a lot, but you really think this is worth it? You think you're just going to give away your capital on this? And I, it wasn't my capital I'd offer him. Right, I, yeah, I, I, I was I'd thinking kept, that might be the punchline, but uh, okay. <laughs> I'd kept my capital, um, and I was just about to click offer, and then I thought, shit, am I giving them their capital? Am I giving them the red capital? Because I think you just have to own the other people's capitals to win this. Uh, so that will be the one extra capital they need, yeah. and they right. will win the game. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. Like, oh fuck, they're yeah. playing on a higher level than me. A ball trade, a ball trade. <laughs> no, 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 we're going back to the old system where there's no peace and there's only war and I'm going to destroy you. And then I lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was kind of miserable actually. It was just reminding me why I don't play Forex games as much as I used to, because it just takes a fucking age. And that leads, I designed my strategy around that fact, because it's like, oh, I can't bother to crush all of the red towns, because it's just going to take fucking hours. Mm. So I move on to the, the orange, hoping I can go for a quick victory. And then I couldn't, and dragging it out that long just whittled mm. my death ball down to like 10 units or 12 units. Um, and attacking a city is pretty much the only thing that could hurt it because cities get not only defending units but they have like a sort of defense bonus as well so that's the only thing that can really hurt me um, and I could have made other armies I could have just built up my towns and defended each one meticulously but it just would have taken so long <laughs> it just would have been such yeah. a would have been my whole week and yeah so it kind of all fell apart in the end and that's a bit sad don't whittle your death balls <laughs> never do that I think it would they could fix it like how do you like that's a perennial forex strategy problem? How, like how how do you fix that? Do you, do you want a fast forward mode the way you just, your troops auto deploy across the territory and 
Uh, you don't have to click everything on it. Yeah, I think, like, ordering around individual troops is a pain in the ass. Uh, at that point, I had, like, eight or ten cities, and making sure they're all building something is a pain in the ass. There's no... You can, like, set a sort of... I think there's some kind of automated mode where you can set, like, mm. okay, you just run yourself. Um, but the problem with that is, Galsip has that too, and the issue is, it's not that I don't care what they build, it's that choosing what to build is not a fun decision. It's an important decision. It still matters, mm. and it's worth doing it for if all you care about is winning. But if what you care about is having fun, it's not really worth doing it because it's just kind of boring. Mm. So setting for that governor mode, it's like you know you're costing yourself something here. You know mm. you're messing up your empire by doing this because the AI will make decisions that don't factor into your your plans. And so I never do it. And I think the only way to get to get around it is you can't make it an option that. Uh, you know, you can let your things be automated. It's got to be either it's it is automated and you can't control it, mm. or you control it completely. And controlling it completely mm. is too slow. So I think you need the thing I wanted to do. Uh, I kind of messed around with making a four X game. I never really got very far with it, but um, uh, I was going to have one army per city, mm. and so that city's army is just always tied to that city forever. And uh, all you do is like click on that city and then right click what you want to attack. And they would also have limited supplies, so there's only so far they can go before they have to return to, to the city to resupply. And that would be automatic. Like, if you send them further than that, they just won't go. Mm. Um, and they, you know, returning them to the city wouldn't even be, like... You wouldn't even have to tell them to go there. It would just be, like, either a single button on their control panel or whatever. Um, or, again, automated. Once they start to run out of supplies, they would just automatically go back to the city. So you always know where they are. You don't have to position them correctly. Um... And you'd only ever have, like, five or six total units. Um, and they'd never be just kind of out there. You always end up in a situation where there's just, like, units just standing around in the territories. And mm-hmm. it's, it keeps asking you, what do you want to do with them? And like, I don't really care. Just something. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's, uh, there'd be any mileage in a game in which... You know, because all these games take aeons. And obviously you are some kind of omniscient... Ruler figure, whether it would be better if you were embodied in some way in order to survive this massive amount of time, you'd have to be readily, you know, regularly kind of podded and put into cryo sleep, during which time the rest, of the, the rest of the world would proceed in your absence, yeah. based on some kind of like uh, high meta level instructions that your kind of deep freeze brain could communicate. But uh, you'd have some kind of like very high level strategic decisions that you'd be able to make, but then you'd come out, obviously, the world would have changed. Yeah, that'd be better good. That's all I want, really, is just some natural reason why I don't have control over this stuff mm. for a while. But I think it has to be baked into the game. I don't think it can be yeah. consensual in any way. Like, you <laughs> could choose when to go in. Or maybe you could choose when to go in, but you'd have to go in based on how old you're getting in order to survive. <laughs> it would be funny, you could do it like presidential terms, and you know, four years are going to be up yeah. soon. You don't know who's going to win the next election, so you've got to set up this empire to be almost yeah. undestroyable and then some asshole wins the election yeah. and you've got to sit back and watch him <laughs> fuck it up for four years then you get voted back in. <laughs> Back in your pod, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> what have you folks been playing? I've been playing N++. Oh, yeah. Um, which is a platformer in which you play a little ninja guy in a minimalist world full of uh, little yellow squares and time is ticking down. Your yellow timer is always ticking down when you're in a level and you, uh, you snuffle up these yellow squares in order to recharge your ever, you know, Ever, ever decreasing timer so you can stay alive and all the, in the meantime you're trying to get to the exit in each level and there are mines everywhere and there are enemies everywhere and there's loads of shit that will kill you instantly and you will die many many times and there are more than 2,500 levels <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so right. this game plus plus. has been in development for 11 years I believe like if you count all mm. of the end developments so is it the same game as N? Yes, essentially it's the same game in terms of a lot of the movement systems, which are the really what the game is all like, is entirely built on. Hmm. N being the freeware original on PC. I believe it was might have been in Flash game way back. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and yeah, people bitched. Well, it got a lot of flack for being a Flash game, uh, but it was also like a downloadable Flash game. You couldn't play it in a browser. Hmm. Someone once tried to make a browser version of it. But basically, it was just it's quite demanding, and if you run it in a web browser, it just didn't run well at that point. Um, and so yeah, it was a flash game you had to download. And did they get they made N two right? Uh, Not N2, that long ago, I think. N two point or N plus. 
Oh. N Plus was the PSP version or something, uh, or like see. a handheld version, and yeah. it was made by an external company. Okay. Um, and then the PC version has been kind of their baby, and they've always updated it. Um, uh, and they've tried to do other projects, and they kind of aborted them all and come back to N. Mm. Um, and yeah, the N Plus Plus has been something they've been working on for a long time as well. Um, and that's meant to be the definitive version. And in fact, they even say in the trailer, no sequels ever. Because <laughs> they're obviously <laughs> fucking sick in this game. I would be. It's fucking great, though. Uh, <laughs> the re- I can see why it took them so long. And you, to look at it, like uh, I think it's, it's gotten a lot of derision from P- PlayStation 4 users because it looks so simple. On the outset, like, the screenshots don't really tell you what it feels like to play. And the thing that N has always had has, has been this very, very unusual sense of momentum, movement, and weight mm. Uh, that takes an enormous amount of mastering to actually, you know, to, to, to be good at the game. And what it's also brilliant at is uh, the level design is superb in terms of the... <laughs> there are... You can hash it and just kind of be not that good at it, but just kind of get in there and get through the level. But you're always aware that there are greater... There are more elegant ways through the level that you could have yeah. taken. And that always motivates you to go back and replay it. And given that there are two and a half fucking thousand levels, <laughs> like you, it's basically all the platforming you could ever want. Yeah. Oh, they can't all be hand designed, are they? Hand designed? Yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, God. They're hand designed. They're, they're definitely hand designed. You can tell. They, them why have they? You know, why have they put this purgatory <laughs> upon themselves? <laughs> yeah. Just. Uh, you can you can see the human hand in in the way it's designed because Gee. there are ways that they they tempt you to take more to riskier routes through the levels that are much harder and that, that I, it seems like an algorithm in the current generation couldn't generate that it's yeah. really a thing that's been put there and, do you yeah. know if they're reused at all from previous versions I think they've already had like a thousand levels in there I, I think a lot of them have, I think there are the so called legacy levels might be just uh, right. repeats of the old because that's I mean levels. Um, I'm not saying that to diminish their achievement because no. those levels they made and that I was saying it because they sh- absolutely should include those yeah, because yeah. the game's They're largely great. the same as I understand it it really is uh, the, the cool stuff about it is this is a really, really good soundtrack and uh, there's, there's, there are many colour palettes that you can switch through that mm. really change the look of the game which is kind of cute, kind of cute. it used to be that, that the whole game is uh, on PC was blue-grey and like dark blue-grey and light blue-grey and those are the only two colours uh, apart from the gold and your ninja was black and uh, if you completed a chapter, which I think was a hundred levels, um, you unlocked like a pink ninja, and it's the exact same sprite, but it's coloured pink. <laughs> and then you unlock the next one, it's like a yellow ninja. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of that stuff because uh, a lot of the colour themes are just question marks at the moment. Uh, right. I think I'll have to, you know, just obtain obscene levels of <laughs> with M plus to, to actually unlock that stuff. So it's got. It's also there are two cool things. One of which has always been an N. Well, it's been an N for many, many years. Is um, in the high score tables, if you're stuck on a level and you look at the high score table and you see this, like, you, you see the global rankings, you can click on those names to actually watch them play that level. You can see exactly how they did it. And I gather that's in the PlayStation version. Oh, well, I've not figured out how to do that, but I remember that being in the earlier versions, and that was yeah. totally awesome. And the other thing is, um, in N++, they have um, a sort of a competitive mode. They also have a cart mode, which I don't know anything about, but the competitive mode is you're all trying to get to the exit and as far as I know you can't hurt each other directly like I think you're immaterial to each other Um, but they added a really great mechanic which is um, ghost mines and mines like in single player uh, obviously you touch a mine you blow up and the mine blows up as well and the fact that that removes the mine from play is not significant in single player because you're dead and you're going to restart the level but in multiplayer of course someone blowing up a mine and leaving it empty gives the next person an advantage Mm -hmm. to get past but uh. all destroyed mines become ghost mines, and if you walk through a ghost mine, it doesn't hurt you, but it creates the mine for the next person. So it makes it respawn. Oh so there's this, every mine is constantly being toggled on and off by oh, these. Yes, yeah. And so you'll like, someone's cleared the mine, and that's great. And so instead of avoiding it, you actually intentionally walk through it in order to set it up for the next guy. But then if you die, you've got to get past it now. <laughs> A lot of the levels are really cleverly designed around those toggling mines, even the single player, so that you oh, right. you jump in certain ways to allow yourself a route back. Right. To leave yourself a route back. If you were to just like walk along all the floor, uh, which is in completely ghost mines, then you would leave yourself a carpet of mines to walk back. <laughs> so it's about jumping into a certain pattern to give yourself a pattern back. <laughs> and that becomes ever more intricate the more you go, the more you go forward in the harder levels. It's it's just it's fucking ridiculous. Is how good it is. I love, I love it. I love it. There, there are also these uh, uh, brilliant mines where you uh, you pass them and then they slowly they're just a disparate 
cloud of pixels that then slowly coalesce and become a ghost version of yourself and <laughs> then tracks where you've jumped in the level uh, and you have to avoid them because if you touch them, uh, them. Oh my god. Yeah. So there are these levels where you're again jumping across a, a, a jumping puzzle from left to right and you'll trigger a couple of these guys and they'll start doing your mo- your motions And but when you actually have to travel from right to left and then avoid yourselves coming at oh, you yeah. like it's, <laughs> it's just so simple but so brilliant it's a really good challenge I hate my past self <laughs> <laughs> do you want to play um, Shuggy? no uh, kind of a, uh, uh, you wouldn't necessarily think to play it because it uh, has a bit of a kind of chirpy cartoon aesthetic which you wouldn't necessarily associate with uh, high class uh, hardcore platformer game but it mm-hmm. involves time mechanics and you've got to uh, trigger past versions of yourselves to do certain things in a level in order to kind of complete the things but you also need to avoid yourself as uh, well and it. it's, uh, it's a fucking nightmare yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I realise that there's a certain point at which my brain cannot cope <laughs> with multiple <laughs> timelines I really I top out at a kind of disappointingly low level there intellectually uh. I'm I'm really glad M plus plus is good. I hope it does well because they've I've known those guys for a long time. Yeah, they N, deserve to be free of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> N was um, uh, an absolute favourite game of mine at the time. I I think my taste kind of changed at some point, and I was less into hardcore platformers after that. Yeah, but it's, it's the only hardcore platform I've, I've ever really loved. Um, and yeah, it's great that it finally came to fruition because they've had a long and frustrating journey to that. Yeah, there's one thing I wanted to ask um, about M plus plus because towards when I started to eventually sort of have my fill of N, I played a lot of it, and at some point I started to like it less, um, partly due to just the novelty wearing off, but um, there was also this, like, certain things I was dying to, I started to blame the game for, <laughs> and it's not really, it is very a very consistent game, it's, it is fair, but it's just sort of unrealistic, maybe, or mm. basically, so the problem, I'm, a specific example of it I'm thinking of is... There were level I got really pissed off with was a level I got really pissed off with was uh, <laughs> one where all of the platforms are just little discs, little circles, and the way it handled curved surfaces was slightly annoying because you would at a certain speed you would slide down them smoothly, mm. and at a slightly higher speed you would sort of slide down most of them but come off them occasionally and then land on them again. So for like a brief second, join the air, not on the platform. Um, depending on kind of your, your current velocity. And that difference is very slight visually, but absolutely critical uh, mechanically, because if you're in the air, you can't press jump. And if you're on the ground, you can. Mm. And so I was just dying all the time to like, oh, I thought I was on the ground there, but I actually wasn't. Or I, like, maybe it's visually clear that I wasn't on the ground, but before I moved, I didn't know that I was moving fast enough that I wouldn't count as being on the surface. And uh, mm. there was something about the way I handled curved surfaces that just I started to find really fiddly and annoying. M, M uh, has always had and still has a very unusual interpretation of how momentum works <laughs> and how hitting angled surfaces can actually almost increase your momentum, yeah. uh, which is very, very unusual and takes a lot of getting used to. And that stuff can, can be very fiddly. And I think when that's adapted to curved surfaces, maybe it becomes that much harder. I can only think of one puzzle where I've had that kind of frustration with curved surfaces where um, there's, uh, there are, there's a level with uh, a circular... Uh, thing in the middle which is rotating with a laser on it that will instantly kill you uh, but there are four ways in and then a, a kind of atrium uh, in which this thing is rotating and the, it's a brilliant level because you can just go right down underneath it by a separate passageway and n- navigate a load of mines to get around it but there's, there's like a super pro way where you just d- dive in towards this circular laser uh, while it's p- pointed downwards and then bounce off it and up through the shit, <laughs> uh, which is um, as soon as I saw that it was an opportunity I just had to fucking <laughs> replay it over and over and over and over and over again so I nailed it which is why I love M Plus because it has it gives you those options you don't have to kill yourself doing that yeah. and the instant restart really total, totally instantaneous restart really allows that but about getting the angle to bounce off that ball in just the way that I could then just shimmy up a passageway mm. was difficult and inconsistent but I think it was just that I wasn't good enough because <laughs> it's a game about trajectories as much as anything about angling the trajectory of your dude uh, as they're like sailing through the air in these really odd arcing patterns and I think it's probably a thing you just have to get really good at <laughs> in order to like it mm. and persist with it there was um, I believe it, the Impulse Plus has a level designer built in and level sharing mm. and stuff it does, and yeah. um, that's also true in the PC version and there was an amazing community that I covered a PC Gamer sometimes called the DDA Levels, um, and it stands for Don't Do Anything. And they make levels where you literally 
don't press any keys and the ninja just starts in a position where they're going to fall down and when they hit the ground they're going to hit the slope and that slope will push them into this jump pad which then launches them into the air another jump pad they'll go past nine enemies and then hit something else and as long as you don't touch anything mm. it will all work out perfectly and the, the ninja will go through the entire level and complete it um, whilst like going through incredible narrow escapes and just causing cascading chain reactions and Amazing. spectacular things. Uh, but it's still, it's not like um, a movie, because it is technically you are playing the game, and if you touch any kind of key at any kind of time, <laughs> you will break it. You'll instantly die, because every other situation is death. Um, and so it was just art, basically. People just making, mm. here's a really amazing thing to watch. That's and awesome. Apparently that's already happening with M++ as well. Ah, so good. Yeah, I, I really hope they're bringing PC, and I think they might, unless unless they're t- so sick of it. Yeah, <laughs> like, so yeah I suppose. <laughs> I'd always assumed it was going to be on PC and PS4 simultaneously, and I hadn't really registered that it was PS4 only, and I did register that a while back. Mm. Um, but yeah, it doesn't seem like they would port it to PC exactly, because they would be sick of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Does it, maybe it's not that hard a job, but uh, he says. I actually, I saw um, just today somebody telling them. Oh, I'd love to see it on PS Vita, and they said, "Oh, if it does well enough, we'll port it." So maybe that's the case with PS Vita. Yeah, they, as well. they said that's us as well. Marsh, hi. What have you been playing, man? I've been playing two things. I've been playing uh, Life is Strange episode four, which I will only say this about, uh, which is that it's one of the most uneven uh, game series I think I've played. Mm. But it's it's kind of st- it's still great, I think. Uh, but this this episode, I mean. Fucking livid! <laughs> really? uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's screaming with anger uh, uh, in, in the uh, quiet of my empty house. Seen people on Twitter going, "Whoa, shit, just got real." With oh, I, no. I have to play the whole series because the reaction on Twitter has yeah. been amazing to watch. Like every episode <laughs> has been has had like, "Whoa, I can't believe the thing in, in Life is Strange." Yeah. And episode four more than any. Yeah. It's been like, what's weird is that everything that's I won't sort of spoil anything, obviously, but the things that uh, people seem to be amazed about. So obviously set up in the previous episode <laughs> that I was totally expecting that. I was t- and and uh, I know uh, our friend Kim uh, played it and was annoyed at this decision uh, or the setup or whatever scenario being presented to you because she th- thought it was emotionally manipulative. But I kind of got beyond that because I, I knew it was going to happen. Mm. Uh, anyway, um, that's all fine. But there's just just like what's so uneven about it is that they I guess they have like different teams working on alternate episodes in order to ship them in time but like one team just doesn't understand how any of their systems work it seems <laughs> so like the basic level you've got like dialogue trees and stuff um, and there's kind of conversational challenges where you need to convince a person of a thing and the entire premise of the game is that you have time manipulation power so you can reverse any decision you yeah. have and mm. go back in time um, but the way this works in this particular in, in so many of the conversations in this is that you're the conversations aren't challenging them themselves. You, as a sensible human being, you would pick the right decisions. Were they properly explained to you? Mm. But the dialogue options are given to you in such vague terminology that you have no fucking clue what it means. It's the I, L.A. Noir problem. It's the doubt, uh, I, you, <laughs> lie thing problem. Yeah, uh, yes, it's, it's exactly that. It's so annoying. Like, but, but I'm so much more invested in it than I was in L.A. Noir mm. for some reason because I really like the characters and the, a lot of the dialogue is actually really well written. It's mm. just that uh, nobody has subbed. <laughs> Nobody, they haven't got Tony Ellis, the, the heroic <laughs> sub of PC Gamer, to go through this and say, this doesn't mean anything, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a difference between like the text presented on screen and then what she actually says when you select it. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah but it's, it's like you'd be given four different options. It's really critical you get this right, otherwise you have to replay the entire conversation. This might take five, seven minutes, something <laughs> like that, like a substantial period of time. Mm. And... Uh, uh, and you'll pick something that seems completely innocuous, like even even completely misleading. You're talking to a guy about his dogs, like, uh, and one of the options is something like fighting dogs. And I know that this guy has rescued dogs who have been previously fighting dogs. Mm. So I think, well, you know, I'm going to bust him up and talk to him about how fighting dogs. And instead, she accuses him of using dogs for fighting. <laughs> <I'm> like, you <laughs> fucking idiot. Yeah. That's not... <laughs> and then, after that, you're locked into a series oh, of conversational things that you cannot escape, and you cannot rewind until you get to the end of the conversation. <laughs> it's just like, why is that? How You know, you've played your own game. You've mm. got three episodes already to look back on to say, I understand it. Anyway, that's really annoying. Uh, <laughs> that is super annoying. And I, I look forward to experience that. Like, yeah. oh, it, it, it's horrible. Like, because the guy you play is a total asshole 
uh, you actually plays two characters in the end, and the second one is fucking brilliant. And the first one you play for a lot of it is mm. is, is, is Ted Lasso. But I remember, yeah, he is, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They had. Uh, <laughs> That there are like three options when you're interrogating someone or just questioning someone on the street not even interrogating them which is like truth doubt or lie and that's means completely different just, things in each conversation just the uh, and also there's just the grammar of that like truth uh, do, uh, am I accusing you of being true or like do I, am I demanding the truth or, <laughs> or am I telling the truth am I telling you yeah, <laughs> yeah, what the fuck does doubt mean so I remember like yeah. there's this lovely old lady who's uh, been traumatised by something and you know uh, she says something and then I press doubt just like uh, thinking um, I'm not sure that's t- entirely true and then Cole Phelps just goes what are you hiding from me, you whore? <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. And I was like, whoa, just, just, whoa, whoa. She starts <laughs> urinating on her. Yeah, then really, she really starts crying. Totally and it's like, oh, I've got all F for the game now. <laughs> <laughs> Go have a yeah. shower. Uh, so, yeah, that, I, I can understand yeah. that, that as a horrible frustration because it seems like such a basic problem to fix, right? Yeah. The rest just, of the game is just, there. Just read it through. Yeah. And then the, the other thing that's annoying about that episode is that probably the stupidest decision that you'll make in the entire series occurs without you having any consent over it mm. and it's like no don't, wait well, what would you do don't do that that's oh. really really don't please don't oh okay I see it has that serious repercussion that I completely expected <laughs> well done mm. yeah and the other game I've been playing which is also <laughs> kind of disaster is um, uh, Zombie Playground which which is interesting, not because it's a good game at all uh, yet, though it could be maybe <laughs> at some point. Um, you may remember like a piece of concept art from 2012, which was doing... Oh, it's called on like, Kotaku and all these places. It was a picture of... Uh, uh, like four kids on this. top of like a helter skelter in a playground. Yeah. It's really beautifully rendered. Uh, the, the, there's one I think he's got a dustbin lid, and they're fighting off these little baby, you know, kid zombies. <coughs> Um, uh, it's, it's, it's by Justin Chan who's an amazing concept artist who works I think for, for Massive Black which is like this conglomerate of uh, amazing concept artists that does bespoke work for film and, and um, games as, as and when they're needed mm. and um, it obviously it captured the imagination the internet you know it shared a lot do you remember this at all? no I don't remember this yeah, I, don't, I, don't, sorry. I, I, I reckon I, I reckon you'll remember the picture if you see it okay. because it did it was kind of like all over the place for, oh, yeah. for weeks um, but then um, obviously it did it did it made enough kind of impact that somebody said oh maybe we should uh, maybe we should try and make a make a game out of this you know mm. like kickstarter we can kickstart the game and so Massive Black uh, a conglomerative concept artist not game designers, but concept artists, um, decided to kickstart uh, a game project based on this, where you would play as a kid fighting other kid zombies in a school, as it turns out. And um, they asked for a modest sum of money, $100,000, I think, which is obviously not nearly enough to make any kind of game. (laughs) And uh, they got it, and they got $160-something thousand dollars, I think, which is still not nearly enough to make any kind of game. And uh, then for many years, they didn't uh, didn't really produce a great deal. Uh, They had had some kind of 3D uh, level wireframes. I think they produced some kind of alpha where you you could walk walk around this environment. Um, But basically things were static for fucking ages. And then uh, a while ago, I think maybe last year or the year before, there was a big kerfuffle and they seemed to pass on the IP to a separate company which Massive Black had spun off in order to make it supposedly spun off. I don't really know the actual the details about how many of the exact people who were working on it originally are now working on it. There mm. seems to be another two companies that are involved oh, Jesus. in it as well who are doing little bits. I don't know, but the thing is, it's impossible to tell what the size of the team is that's involved in this. I pity... like. Our, I was, I was mean about it uh, on RPS because it's not very good and it's been a long time coming and I've obviously people who've paid money for this who mm. are upset about a lack of fulfilment on those promises but I don't I don't really I, I feel bad for the people who are now in charge of making this game because they may be well talented I don't know what their kind of resources that are disposal probably not a lot now after so many years yeah. and um you know, I, I imagine what they're trying to aim for is like a basic fulfilment of the Kickstarter promises to kind of avoid being horribly sued. I, I don't really know, but um, all that they have achieved so far in this time is to have like a, 
uh, this the school environment, which is only partly explorable. It's very low poly, uh, and uh, and I think it's I guess it's made in Unity. It's kind of lit in an underwhelming way. There's no dynamic shadows. There's, it just kind of looks. But it, it, I, I know that sounds like a, a kind of biscuity thing to say about <laughs> uh, a, a game, but <laughs> only only kidding, John. Um, but the um, but it's kind of important in this case because that game was sold on the imagination of that particular image. You know, yeah. mm. the fidelity that that image presented you with was the game that you were picturing in your head. And you know, they said it was going to be like a, a you know a brawler, but also an RPG and all these other things. They've got an XP system in the game. Doesn't really. There's no point to mm. it. You can just level up, and then you can play the level again. You level up more. You play the level again. You have different objectives within that level. They're both all rubbish so far. <laughs> like just mm. kill more zombies. You know, well, I don't really want to. Um, and that's it. And it's just uh, it's, you, 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 there's, there is a, there's a combat system in there which is reasonably interesting. There's like a time based attack system so that you, you, know, you strike your weapon glows if you strike your gun when it glows then you get a different kind of combo and you, it's a different combo depending on whether you strike once or twice and then three times mm. and then wait and that's that's actually interesting you get kind of mobility but it hasn't been matched with any of the kind of other things that exist in the game so constantly enemies just respawn they respawn right out of the ground right next to you all the time forever mm. and that doesn't so all the mobility options that you have a kind of moot because you'd just be moving out of the way and into another group of enemies one thing and if you wait for any amount of time you're just leaving yourself open to be attacked whereas you could just stagger people by just thrashing forever the same button and none of the you know all the that's fine like I mean you know it's, uh, it's in early access they're saying this is not a finished game by any means but it's not a finished game by any means. <laughs> like, it's not even it's not even the game that you would pitch to Kickstarter yet. Mm. As a game, and I don't know, I just it just feels like uh, the cautionary tales of Kickstarter are coming to home to roost in a big fucking way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were, we all said this was coming. Like, yeah, I know. A few years ago, we literally <laughs> had these conversations about probably, probably on this podcast a lot of the time. Yeah. years ago, about okay, in a few years' time, we'll see the big successes and failures of Kickstarter. Mm. And what it's, uh, it's transpired has happened is that. We've, there are successes and failures, but also people who are locked into eternal fucking horrible purgatory, trying to fulfil promises that yeah. they could never actually reach. And well, never... I feel, I, you know, I, th- I, mean, I feel worse for the developers than I do for the people who backed it. Probably who, who backed it with, you know, um, um, an, an amount of money that was relatively inconsequential to them. I hope, on the most part, like maybe some people put around a huge amount of money. I don't know, but uh, mm. like for the most part, you can imagine people doing the kind of minimum. Mm. Kickstarter reward put down the money for it yeah. and I don't think those people are going to be as punished by the development cycle of this game <laughs> <laughs> as the developers themselves I feel really bad for them and I just, uh, I just I really hope that after six months which is what they anticipate staying in early access for they do come out with something worth worthwhile playing I think it's not impossible I don't think it's ever going to live up to the imagination of the people mm. who, who uh, went for that Kickstarter in the first place but you know, it's just, it's just, it's a brutal thing to witness. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty grim. That is, it's pretty grim. I, I, I've always had a problem with the way that Kickstarter is probably accidentally presented what it is you're investing in. Um, in that, a lot of people, I think, who contribute to Kickstarter, think they're going to get the dream in their head, mm. and there's not really perhaps en- enough messaging about the fact that a lot of projects fail and a lot of projects will change yeah. and be, become very different and the realities of game development are incredibly difficult and things can change course and have to change course in order to become a good game instead of trying to go you know become the original idea for the game that it wasn't very good yeah well which was just a piece of or, concept or art. indeed <laughs> just a piece of fucking flat concept art uh, yeah. and I, I don't I'm going to kickstart a noose and then as a stretch goal <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a chair <laughs> and I, uh, another stretch goal I'm going to stand on that chair and put a noose over my head <laughs> uh, uh, you know it's grim it's grim stretch goals are particularly mad mm. I think but you just you don't know enough to make that <laughs> yeah. call right now you can't yeah. make that call right now it's a really bad idea it's just outright like, detrimental to the game talk about like feature creep being a problem of uh, like game planning but enforced feature creep due mm. to monetary like we're obliged it, to, to a load of people like that's and also it's just worse. it's such a fiction that oh if we get the minimum amount 
Don't we'll have money left over? We'll just have this big pile of money. What will we do with it? How will we ever spend this? <laughs> no, you'll burn through what you asked for and twice what you asked for, yeah, yeah, making yeah. the basic bare minimum that you promised. Well, the amount they asked for wouldn't even pay for a single program after work for, <laughs> for mm. you know, what, two yeah, years? I guess? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's, it's more disturbing if they can pull it off, because then it's like, well, yeah. how much do you pay? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, Tommy managed to do it really well, but then you, you put a lot of your own free time into it, programming and building it. Well, for Gunpoint, yeah, it was all revenue share, so everyone worked for revenue share. Mm. So no, nobody, none of us paid anything as we worked on it, and then only after it came out to make money. Mm. And then, because it did well, we, we, um, we did well. But if it had bombed, we all would have been totally cheated of our time. <laughs> but, I mean, that was the... We were just completely upfront about that. And I never suggested to anyone who worked on it that it was going to be successful. I always say that it was, we have no idea. Mm. In fact, everyone who worked on Gunpoint, when they signed on, I hadn't decided yet whether to charge for it. So they signed on knowing that it might just be free and they might mm. make zero money. Yeah, sure. And, like, the, all of the investment there is the people making the thing. And, then, and the investment is time. As soon as it becomes a question of strangers investing in your thing with false ideas of what it might become. Yeah. But like, that just opens up so much, so many problems. Yeah, very scary. Yeah, it's terrifying. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> shall we do some questions? We shall do some questions. Questions. Thank you, as always, for your questions. Uh, the first one today, from Henry Stenhouse. Best gaming soundtracks to buy, question mark? Possibly for Jim Muse. Uh, I think we've probably answered this before in some way, but a new one popped up uh, t- today, uh, particularly for, for gym-based kind of activities, which is the Myriad soundtrack. Myriad being... I don't think you can actually buy it as a soundtrack yet, so obviously it's, <laughs> it's a shit answer, but um, uh, it will be presumably available to buy. Myriad being... I don't even know what kind of game it is. Some kind of music-based score attack game doesn't look exactly like a shooter it looks fucking mental you should definitely look at oh, the videos yes, it's played by um, Erlen Grefsrud oh yeah I know that guy uh, or Grefsrud uh, who is uh, Slactus mm. uh, on, the, on the Twitters and um, the game looks psychedelic and crazy in, in uh, some kind of abstract way which I can't quite parse exactly how it operates mm. but it has this amazing fucking soundtrack by I've written this down uh, Matthias Rudsengen, uh, otherwise known as Fastland, um, on SoundCloud, <laughs> and his his tracks are amazing and uh, they're great and they're you know they're really kind of upbeat and exciting mm. and uh, uh, they're the perfect kind of gym music I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I recently watched uh, you know the Summer Games Done Quick thing we talked about last mm. time. Um, I watched the Hotline Miami 2 speedrun they did. Oh, oh yeah. That's fucking amazing Although um, that's more kind of like murdering people in an alley music with a hammer. Definitely. Than, than, uh, if you're going to do that, yeah. cue this up. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that, what was conspicuous about it was I was I knew I was never going to play it, so I wanted to watch a speedrun just to find out what was in it. Um, and that's the, literally the quickest way to do it. There's no quicker way to find out what's yeah. in a game than watching a speedrun. Um, and it was interesting because they have very strong opinions about it. You'd think like, speedrunners would be the, I don't know, in some ways, you think they'd be the massive fans of it because they're playing it obsessively, um, but they are just as critical of Hotline Miami 2's levels as, as a oh, reviewer would be. Like, like oh. this one's just garbage. It's just <laughs> throw some bullshit at you, and they'll bitch about all these different ways things work. Uh, they agree with Chris Thurston that um, dogs are broken. <laughs> um, and but the other thing they say is every time a level starts, almost every single level they say, "Oh, this, this one's like a, it's got a really good pace to it. I really like this level, uh, and the music is just one of the best tracks in the game." And the next <laughs> level they say, "This one's quite tough. It's but it's really, really long and actually quite satisfying. And the music is one of the best tracks. <laughs> yeah. Such good music. Yeah. yeah, those guys do pick a good soundtrack. That's to be said. Although that's all kind of fucking nightmarish, horrible kind of horrible psychedelic synth of the, of the kind of the most mm. horrendous kind like it's, I mean, it's wonderful great music but it's also it also is the music of of having a bad trip while <laughs> while being covered in blood somebody else's blood it's fun <laughs> to program to this <laughs> it's like it sort of adds a time pressure that doesn't normally exist I, I think it, so if you're on a, a treadmill and you want to go to a really dark place <laughs> then yeah. put on the Hotline Miami 2 soundtrack which was actually going to be my suggestion as well because <laughs> yeah. it matches itself brilliantly to playing and stuff can you buy it separately is it I'm sure you can DLC yeah. for the main game or? it's definitely included as a separate thing if you yeah, buy certain editions I think of the I game. saw that I'm actually the way I've listened to it is um, uh, just for convenience on Spotify 
there is a playlist called that made by a, like an artificial user mm. who has collated all the tracks that are on Spotify that are that appear on that. I'm pretty sure it's, it's just uh, as og, og files right. with, the, with the game itself, so you can probably just play it. All over YouTube as well if you want to mm. give it a, a casual listen that done the other thing. Tom Sabatino writes, Dear CNC, am I a shit person? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oh. Oh. <laughs> From one Tom to another. <laughs> but this is big, so cool. <laughs> I know developers spend years putting their heart and soul into some games, but I dismiss most of them after only a couple of hours. Uh, some I know are cult classics and have Steam users logging thousands of hours. The most dedicated of these users even found a way to bend space and time just so they could put 250 plus hours a week into their favourite title. Um, while I've played through my Mass Effect multiple times and Spelunky Daily a Day keeps the Doctor away, for the <laughs> most part, I just browse the surface level of a game and once I, uh, quotes, figure it out, I usually toss it Move on to the next thing I bought on the cheap. My question, how long do you give a game to wow you before moving on? Cheers, Tom. P.S., he writes, I have played through Gunpoint twice. Oh, what a shit person. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel bad now, Tom? Don't you feel bad now? I was going to say, actually, that um, the... Uh, like, he seems to feel bad that he hasn't massively played games that other people are massively playing. Mm. And I think you shouldn't feel bad about that at all because like from a developer's perspective there are people out there who fucking love your game and they're playing it for thousands of hours you don't give a shit that there are some people who don't like you're not like oh but that one guy he only played for an hour what's wrong with him we hate him he's a shit person <laughs> um, like you get that some games are for some people and they're not necessarily for everyone um, and definitely like if you give the game a chance then you've done all you're obliged to do for sure I guess the, the question is like uh, how much of a chance do you give a game? What is it that really yeah. switches you off a game? Like? Well, I, so I definitely um, I really uh, came to think about this a lot with puzzle games because I played a lot of puzzle games where um, I would just have like a really specific moment of f- fuck this, <laughs> just got the fuck this point, and it's it's quite easy to identify why it happens when it happens um, mm. because it's almost always tied to. Um, a, the first time they introduce death, if it's a difficult game, like you go through the first two or three tutorial levels and it's they teach you this mechanic, that mechanic, and the th- that mechanic, and on this one, if you fall in the lava, you reset the whole level. And if that doesn't piss me off enough to quit, it'll be the first level that has actual challenge and that in. Like as soon as you combine challenge and losing progress, that's when I'm usually out, if I'm not absolutely loving it. Um, and so if you're a game designer, you should think about delaying that moment for as long as possible until you've really... Certainly don't put that moment before you've explained the full potential of what it is you're trying to do with the game. Like, if you have some cool mechanic that has some interesting consequences, introduce the interesting consequences before you introduce the punishing repetitive failure. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, for me, it's when there's an element that is outside of my control that kills me and loses progress. Yeah. Uh, in, in any context, it could be a puzzle game or a combat game. Uh, like an instant kill mechanic that uh, takes me out when I feel it hasn't been like maybe the the system hasn't been properly explained or it feels as though there's some kind of I don't know it feels like the the, uh, the environment is conspired against me in a way that I was never able to, would never have been able to overcome yeah the thing is there's so many things you can do with your time nowadays like I, I just yeah. I have I think my cruising altitude is something like a nanometer above the fuck this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, like uh, the uh, Batman uh, Arkham Knight fell victim to this because I went mm. because Chris's way. So I thought, Ooh, ooh yeah, yeah, finally I get to use his PS PS4 and I can <laughs> play Batman. And then I was, I couldn't read any of the button prompts because mm. they're too small <laughs> and they're on a screen which is several meters away from me and. You know, introduces almost instantly uh, like a quite a complex from what I can tell by the blurred pixels that are some distance away from me complex button point for dealing with people who are charging at you and it, ha- it gives you like maybe a second to read mm. that like I will need to stand up move two meters closer to you <laughs> bend down and read that for a good second before I can pause what that says <laughs> um, and that combined with like some really totally dog shit fucking c- cinematics at the beginning of that game, and then a tank section, uh, like maybe f- six minutes into the game, I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna wait for this to come out on PC." <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it <laughs> of people charging towards you? I had that sort of problem as well. I, I, I could read the prompt fine. Well, in theory, I could read it fine, but it was always in the middle of combat when I'm dealing with nine other things. Yeah, yeah. and there was something I. 
eventually it was like left trigger or something or left button and I always get those two confused or like it was L1 or L2 and I didn't know which one was L1 or L2 you have to double tap L2 thing. and it. the other thing is even once I knew the button was I thought it was saying I didn't know it doesn't say what it does it just says the person charging you press that and I thought it meant like that was the counter so when they reach you you should press it mm. but actually if you wait for them to reach you it'll never work you always have to press it before they reach you Whereas every other counter, you have to press when they do it. Oh, uh, right. And uh, it's actually what it will do when you press it is you throw a batarang at them and then they get knocked over by that. And so it's a way of stopping them from getting to you in the first place. But for ages, I thought it was a way of countering them once they got to you. So for ages, it just never, ever worked. <laughs> yeah, we were talking in a previous podcast about tilt and how Batman puts people on tilt in ways that other games don't. And like the first the, the tutorial section, which basically lasts until the end of Ace Chemicals, it's full of just bullshit bits <laughs> that... Uh, so, you know, we've spoken before about the, the hostage situation inside a building where they then expect you to train outside with <laughs> yes. augmented reality sections. Right, like when there's a, a life-threatening hostage situation happening like 10 metres away. <laughs> there's a load of very strange stuff in that game. Uh, it's definitely... There's a lot of points in that game where I mm. would alt F4 if I didn't like Batman so much. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm definitely going to go back to it because obviously mm. I've seen Chris playing bits which look great. Yeah. And I want to play those bits. It's just... I just it wasn't enough for me to tolerate. <laughs> like I was just thinking, yeah, I I could watch that interesting film I just saw on Amazon Prime. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. But, yeah, yeah. The uh, once you get out of Ace Chemicals, that's where the game like properly gets good. Mm. Really good, really starts. Next question from Zach, dear Mister Video Games. <laughs> I was in some woods the other day. <laughs> I, <coughs> I couldn't think of a game that had captured the claustrophobic excitement of a wood. In a proper forest, thanks to the top of the uh, top of the uh, topographical topography topography uh, of rum and photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could barely see twenty feet in any direction. This makes the world uh, an odd glimpse of the sun, a deer, or a luridly coloured condom. All the more thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, have any games done a good wood? Kind regards, Zach Forest. Have they done a good wood where you can see a condom? So no condom, but excellent wood in The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, which used the special technique for scanning textures from photographs onto oh, yeah. the surfaces oh, in the game, okay. and has excellent bark as a result. <laughs> yeah, good good bark. bark. Yeah. Top Did you, bark. I need someone to confirm this to make sure I'm not going mad. Did you see the flashing lights in Ethan Carter? In the trees? Well, there's no the, one saw that exactly. Yeah, there's stuff that ha- weird stuff that happens in the woods. Like, I don't mean like a special scripted event or something, but just all the way out the game. Um... <laughs> There would, I would often be at, like just wandering around the open world and wondering where to go next. Right. And there would be a flashing light in the trees that's either white or red. And I, the way I deduced it worked was that red meant I hadn't been there and white meant I had, or, or vice versa. And every like very rarely there'd be a blue light. But this was throughout the whole game, and like every five minutes I would see one of these things. Was flashing the game in the trees. telling you to kill people? <laughs> <laughs> no one else just, has seen this. I'm, just I'm really worrying about it. Kill and kill. No, I. I've never experienced that. That's I've only played the whole, first half hour of the game. Was this? this I played this the entire present. game. I didn't oh, see any of that. The whole thing constantly. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that, no, <laughs> listeners, please write in if you have experienced this. Hero, Brian. I think your game. Is <laughs> it was really useful. It told me like, oh, I need to go this way next. <laughs> Patrick writes, dear Quentin Grover. I've written in before to ask about music, games, and the mental association between the two when randomly juxtaposed. Posing my way through Transport Tycoon as a youth left a permanent bond between the two, for example. I now turn to that most primal of all memories, smell. I remember my first smell. I don't. <laughs> Is that a primal memory? Anyway, do you associate any games with smells? Do you think some games should support smell if it becomes available? Uh, and which games would you most like to take a good whiff of? Thanks for sniffing, everybody. Patrick, <laughs> I I have a very very strong uh, association between uh, the smell of teasels and what's uh, a teasel? It's like a it's like a big dry thistle. Oh yeah, okay. Okay. so you've probably seen them, like a big uh, like the, almost the size of that microphone right before you. <laughs> so As you can sh- see, podcast listeners, <laughs> <laughs> but shaped out of vegetation instead okay. of and, and it's dry and it's kind of spiky mm. but anyway uh, between that and uh, the Super Mario Brothers 2 uh, <laughs> and also that memory is connected with riding a bike for the first time and all those things why? Why? together because I learned to ride a bike while I was playing Mario 2 in a room full of teasels <laughs> it's, not, it's really not that it's not that it's not <laughs> how the hell do those things I'm doing the maths here, <laughs> I'm doing the maths but the logistics are you rode a bike indoors 
No, no, that just happened at the same kind of time in my oh, life. Okay, as okay. I, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to figure this one I'm writing place a bike while playing Super Mario Bros. 2 with a teasel stuffed in my nose. <laughs> I, I don't think... I just play all the games in the same place, so the <laughs> the smell is always the same. <laughs> the stench of my own life rotting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Whereas the music is very different each time. <laughs> Did you not? You, you must. I mean, did you not play games as a kid and have an association of that smell with those games? No? I, yeah, I mean, I we used to. My first computer was a BBC Micro, and that was in one room of the house. And then later on, my dad got a PC, and that was in a different room of the house. And then I got a PC, and that was in my bedroom. So in theory, those must have all been different environments. But I don't remember any smells from them. Huh. What games would you like to smell too? Hmm. Um, definitely Oblivion uh, oh. or Skyrim. Um, it would mostly like smell as shit. Forest, like forest, the entire smell, of the medieval forest area. smell really uh, good. Okay, in general yeah. and snow actually has a really nice smell. I'd uh, I'd pick one of the MMA games. What just, the smell of sweat and yeah, and just blood. Uh, you get right in their crotch. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, get right in their crotch is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want that really. Mm. That's what you claim. <laughs> uh, anyway. Cook served James. delicious, Graham's favourite. Oh, yeah. Would probably be a good one. Well, yeah. It's got food in it. Ever James writes, Dear Crate and Crowbar, it's common to mention your favourite heroes from video games. It's also pretty common to mention your favourite villains. For games like Mass Effect, we often pick a favourite companion from the hero's party. But what about the villain's companions? <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite henchman, mini boss, or Mrs. Evil Overlord from a video game? I pick Ultros from Final Fantasy VI, an evil octopus who famously tries to interrupt a performance by dropping an anvil on the lead singer. Final Fantasy VI is fucking great, <laughs> as an aside. Um, who is this octopus? What made him evil? Why does he hate the theatre? Nobody knows. It adds a touch of whimsy and variety to an expansive, surprising game. Uh, who would you pick and uh, what quality makes a good minor villain? Mini bosses, gentlemen. Good ones. I, I want to know what the uh, this is a Nintendo game, but what the deal with the uh, eggplant wizard is in um, Kid Icarus? Like, what, why why is he an eggplant for one thing? Why does he want to turn other people into eggplants? Is it like a fucking fetish? What is the? <laughs> why would that? How, why would that be your aim? Like you're just hanging around what, in what appears to be some kind of tomb slash maze, turning people into eggplants. It's just an odd. It's an odd thing to do. Uh, Just kill them. That is, that is an odd thing to do. I was always very confused by Mental Block in Zool. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. What the fuck was his game? <laughs> was Apart block. from the pun, obviously. That was clearly like the only reason that he existed. But what was going on? He was a block and he was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> a block who went wrong. I get, I'm struggling to think of like villain companions. I also, I guess I... As I said earlier, I don't play that many games with bosses in them, so mm. like, I tend to selectively avoid those. So there aren't that many mini bosses in the games I play. I feel like, like even Splunky doesn't really have any mini bosses. It's got the okay. My favorite, my favorite boss's companion is the tribesmen who are worshiping Olmec at the end of Splunky mm. because he immediately crushes them for worshiping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like the. The little wizard from Resident Evil 4 turns into a giant uh, plant-like tentacle monster uh, yeah. in, in Skate's castle. He's a, he's a good <laughs> kind of mini-boss. And also... like, What, what was that? What, what was it what, for him? What? What are you doing, <laughs> I'm really bad. Well, this is the truth of the whole entire Resident Evil series. Like, yeah. All these people are like, ah, ha, ha, now you've come to my castle, now I'm going to turn into a horrible oily sausage monster. Yeah. <laughs> like, Why would you want that? That yeah. seems like a... It's that's a, a bad deal for you. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to kill you with guns. Exactly. Like, if the little, if the little wizard do to just let me through without turning into a giant like plant penis yeah. I, I would have just carried on my way as oh, it was actually um, I really oh, like the the hover torso in Jedi Knight <laughs> the hover torso <laughs> one of the bad guys was just like a hovering torso he like lost his whole lower body in some Jedi accident probably <laughs> yeah. and so he, he would just hover around it was, I think it was a shitty boss fight because he was flying and all flying enemies are terrible mm. um but he was a distinctive character stuck in my memory. There were like they had some quite characterful bosses in that. Like all of the, it was a kind of mini boss structure. You would in each section you were I think working towards defeating a certain evil Jedi, and um, that evil Jedi would be someone with an actual personality who'd be in cutscenes and stuff. And they probably weren't great characters, but they like at least they stuck in my memory <laughs> to some extent. Uh, I'm going to read this from Damien from Australia. 
who writes Dear Koalas and Kookaburras. <laughs> Good day from Australia, mates. <laughs> uh, well themed. Yeah, really, uh, yeah. On, <laughs> on point there. On point there, on fleek. Uh, and I'm going to truncate this a little bit, I'm afraid, Damien, because we're running out of time. But I will open this first paragraph. In episode 103, it was mentioned that no one on the podcast had been to Australia and that it was visualised as a desert that was full of things that can kill you. <laughs> Surely not. Us Surely. racial stereotyping? Uh, you'll be pleased to know that this is simply not true. We have plenty of water and green landscapes also filled with things that can kill you, <laughs> such as sharks, jellyfish, crocodiles, and even kangaroos who look like they've been lifting heavy at the gym. Uh, he attaches a photo that, uh, if we can recover it from the email. It, it is a really hench kangaroo. Fucking hell, we should get that in the show notes. Uh, anyway, my question is... What game mechanic did you only discover significantly deep into a game which had either improved or ruined the experience you had taken from the game so far? <laughs> was it the fault of the game designer who failed to reveal this mechanic in a suitable manner? Or was it your fault, the player, for not experimenting with the parameters of the game? Uh, he also writes about Rocket League, and he talks about our discussion last week, I think, uh, where we were talking about double jumping in Rocket League and how that affects your trajectory and stuff. Um, and uh, he, about, uh, apparently he hadn't quite realised that you could double jump <laughs> and that was that was a, a realisation yeah I don't, think I, I, I don't think I would have known that had somebody not told me actually and there you go I'm sure it was in the tutorial uh, probably it, <laughs> so I think who plays the tutorial like I think about most people will probably skip the tutorial and just try and play a game and he says I, I double tapped the jump uh, I double tapped the jump button and to my surprise my rocket power car double jumped I spent the whole match double jumping around working out how the new mechanic behaved probably to the disgust of my teammates who probably wanted a bit more play from me uh, he says thanks for producing such a wonderful podcast and thank you Damien for the I remember in Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis it turns out I can't imagine how this control scheme worked but the punching I feel I might be misremembering this but I feel like the punching was you press the number keys because I there was a cheat basically that I discovered genuinely by myself I didn't like, look it up or anything where if you held down the zero key and then pressed the nine key Indy would do a sucker punch where he like grabbed them and did an uppercut and it knocked anyone out in one hit. <laughs> it just solved all the fights in the game except one. And there's just one fight where like this really like butch German dude has singled you out and you have a fight with him. And if you try that, he has a special line of dialogue for if you try that cheat on him. And he says, ah, that trick won't work with me, Mr. Jones, or whatever. <laughs> and then um, you have to carry on playing the fight normally. <laughs> and that was a bizarre mechanic that I didn't know was there until I discovered it. And I guess it kind of ruined the game <laughs> in many ways. Hmm. Um, I thought I had an example for this, uh, but I, I knew I couldn't quite remember it. So I voted for this question <laughs> on the basis that I would remember it, it would by this time. I haven't. So. You don't know what game it was? Or? I remember there being something about... I think it might be one of the Ghost Recon games, but that one of the earlier Ghost Recon games that turned out on PC. And I think the build of it I played didn't have uh, any kind of quick save feature. And I remember hammering it for it in the review, only for it to turn out that it did have a quick save <laughs> feature uh, upon release but I was unable to oh, check the that. version that I had for it yeah. actually did in the end have that but, huh. uh, there's um, I don't know if this is really counts but like Axiom Verge I got the grappling hook in that and I tried using it I was like I, when I, I didn't know there was a grappling hook in it until I got it and then when I got it I was like oh my god there's a grappling hook in this game this is fantastic I was already enjoying it I thought this was the turning point it would be one of my favourite games ever and I tried to use it and I almost just rage quit immediately <laughs> like, just on the first attempt to use it I was just like what the fucking fuck what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> I've never had something annoy me so fast so much <laughs> and it's like you attach the grappling hook and then you, you don't swing at all by default and then you have to press left or right to swing and then, if you're still holding left, when you reach the apex, or just when you start swinging, he disconnects the grapple automatically. So just, just trying to swing makes you cut the rope. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, what the fuck? Are you, what the hell? How can this possibly be right? <laughs> and this is not how I expect grappling hooks to work. And I, I'm imagining this sort of like physics-y grappling hook where you, you, know, you swing at a certain distance and you can retract or pay it out and detach at a time of your choice and then the challenge becomes to detach at the exact right time to get the maximum sideways velocity to get to where you want to go and uh, so at first I just thought this was the worst thing in the world and I was actually going to quit playing the game forever <laughs> and then <laughs> thought, the worst thing in the world yeah literally the worst crime ever committed by <laughs> any human being <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought oh well 
I don't. I can't actually remember why I went back to it. I think I was maybe not giving it another chance. Just... I thought that was Batman not having too small text on the prompts. Are you saying there's something worse than that? In my opinion, I mean, I haven't played it on PS4. Worse so. than both the Holocaust and that? <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, anyway, I, what I eventually figured out was that it's not really a physically grappling hook. It's more like a kind of jump booster. And really, you just do a jump, and then you press the grappling hook button, and you just keep on holding the direction that you want to go in. And the grappling hook connects, swings you in that direction, and then automatically disconnects at the exact like extremity of your jump. Huh. Which is not the right time to disconnect if it was physics-based, because at the extremity of your jump, you have no velocity. Hmm. It's yeah. at, the, at the bottom of your jump that you have the most actual lateral velocity and at the extremity of a jump that's when you've lost but, your velocity and you're about to swing back so it'd be stupid to disconnect. Worms 2 literally solved this. <laughs> <laughs> Worms 2 had the best swinging system. But it's, it's kind of the reason this question reminded me of it is because once you know how to use it it's actually a really useful tool and it right. just let, lets you jump a bit further it's very it's almost idiot proof once you know how to use it because you just hold down one key there's no skill to it. Hmm. Um, you do uh, there's a skill to pre- when to actually attach it because you have to choose which bit of roof you want to attach to and you've got to do that at the right time you're going to jump. But after you've attached it, the swinging process is not like any other grappling hook. It's just you hold down the key, you, the direction you want to go in, and, and you'll go there up. to the maximum extent that you can. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, perform Ikaruga, which had a, has a very positive version of this, um, where merely completing the game as an ordinary human uh, is only half the game, because just staying alive isn't really what it's all about. It's about getting the high score. And the way, the way you get high scores in Ikaruga is by killing enemies in threes. And all <laughs> enemies in Ikaruga are either uh, light polarity or dark polarity. And you have shields in Ikaruga, which let you switch between light polarity or dark polarity. And if you are the same polarity as the uh, enemy fire, then you will just absorb their bullets and turn it into missiles. If you're the opposite polarity, you'll kill in one hit. Uh, so surviving this is incredibly difficult. It's an amazing game in many ways. Uh, but... As soon as you realise that in order to get the highest possible scores, you have to kill in threes of like three red, three red, three white, three red, three white, three white. Doesn't matter what order. Um, as long as you're killing in threes, it's fine. Then you start to notice that the ent- every level throughout the entire game has been designed around that principle, <laughs> and you never even notice it if you're just trying to survive the game. You don't realise that, of course, um, enemies coming in in you know multiples of twelve or multiples <laughs> of, multiples of three throughout. Um, or the fact that these huge carriers, which have these, uh, have eight kind of uh, mini turrets on the sides that you can then blow off, and then you destroy the central uh, craft afterwards to get a three chain of nine, <laughs> and uh, it'll throw two of these things at you at the same time, and they're throwing out loads and loads of bullets. But suddenly, the entire game becomes this mathematical challenge <laughs> huh. of kind of how do you get threes out of squeeze threes out of this scenario, and then suddenly you start noticing things the game designers have left in there to, to let you get extra chains that you would never ever have noticed if you were just playing <laughs> to survive the game so there's a little block puzzle section where there are red and white blocks moving around you and of course like you can destroy red blocks faster with white bullets etc etc and there are just loads of just blocks around the side and you think that's they're just filling the width of the level with blocks uh, but when you go through looking for max scores they're points so you're looking at ways to get all those tertiary extra little blocks and then suddenly the entire level just behaves completely differently. <laughs> that happens so often in a Kruger. And um, brilliantly, your fully charged rocket burst which homes in on the nearest 12 enemies, 12 of course, because <laughs> it gives you a chain, uh, encourages you to snipe out in certain sections all of, for example, the, the dark enemies, leaving just 12 white enemies within your blast radius. <laughs> and there's a, there are these beautiful moments where you've just like done this beautiful sniping move and then just bosh! All those home missiles go out. You see your chain just go up, and you hear your machine murmuring to you about how amazing you are. Mm. <laughs> are there uh, people who max scored Ekaruga mm. on on the YouTube's? There are people, and not only that, there are people who have done it on arcade machines, playing two player, uh, one player with each hand. <laughs> <laughs> and what? that is what I'm going to send you the link Marshall you can put it in the show notes yeah. because that is <laughs> fucking bullshit. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. It's amazing because. Co-op in Ikaruga is extraordinary uh, because, of course, you can hold uh, a dark player behind a white player and, you know, that's a shield for the dark player to deal double damage to everyone else who he's firing past. Like, huh. So you can use the player in front of you to shield yourself, but it requires extraordinary 
uh, coordination between two players. Unless, Unless you have to be person. the same person <laughs> with one brain, and apparently the left side, like hemisphere of your brain, is controlling the right stick, and the, <laughs> the right side is controlling the left stick. And then you know this guy is is, is just ridiculous. You'll Does Ikaruga do something special with like enemies coming from the side versus the front or something? I, I feel like it came up in a discussion that I was having on Twitter about the virtues of side-on versus top-down, because mm. I sort of like top-down better. And then I think, actually, it was um, uh, Reagan of Metanet, of the end creators, mm. who said that he liked, I think it was Ikaruga, um, because usually the reason he prefers side-on games is that the two dimensions are fundamentally different. The vertical dimension is fundamentally different to the horizontal one. Horizontal one, you move freely. Vertical one, there's gravity. Mm. Right? And in a top-down game... X and Y are sort of interchangeable. They don't have any special properties. Yeah. And I feel like he was talking about some shoot 'em up, and I thought it was Ikaruga that used the side, like side was completely different to top in some way. No, I think <laughs> fair enough. I don't, I don't think there's much difference. It's just it finds a lot of ways of throwing patterns at you by ambushing you from the sides in ways that is occasionally bullshit. Is the way like, I'd, I'd mark Ikaruga down. In fact, did for the fact that like in phase four it just ambushes you with bullshit attacks from the sides like the walls come in in ways that you could never possibly predict based on any of the things that have happened to you up until that point and it's just a kind of rote repetition by which you learn that and that's kind of a bullshit way of learning things and you should be able to do things better but apart from that it's it's, it's fucking amazing (laughs) and almost impossible (sighs) and with that that's all the questions we have questions for (laughs) Which were also fucking amazing and nearly impossible. <laughs> As we approve. Anyway, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, mm. you can follow the Crate and Crowbar account at, at Crate and Crowbar. Uh, if you'd like to join our lovely forum full of um, lovely people, you can go to crateandcrowbar.com forward slash forum. Um, you can send us more questions. Yes, please do. And uh, we have a Patreon account, of course, which... Uh, you can find a link on our website www.crateandcrowbar.com and I and forgot the URL email for questions is questions at crateandcrowbar.com great I'll just give, we'll just give you these and just to completely run crowdsourcing <laughs> <laughs> our uh... <laughs> <laughs> there's also a donate button if you if you feel like giving us a few quid or whatever uh, and you can also follow us individually of course uh, Marsh I'm at Marsh Davis that's D-A-V-I-E-S and Tom I'm at Pentadact, P-E-N-T-A-D-A-C-T. And I'm at PCG Ludo, L-U-D-O. Uh, thanks thanks for so much, Something we uh, completely forgot to mention during the main podcast uh, was that we received a very nice email from uh, a young lady asking us to wish a happy birthday to her big brother, Jacob Rose. So, happy birthday, Jacob Rose. Sorry we didn't mention you in the main podcast, uh, but we were really quite drunk. <laughs>